So this is here behind the business, how Burger King started the story of Burger King. And this is where we're going to start with figure out start with Burger King. And then we'll go through the other ones uh, on the model. Um, actually, seeing that I am not currently using the CFC screen right now, let's um, pop this over here. So we'll keep the painting on the right for the most part. Video on the left. Cool. And I'll just juggle these around as it makes sense. Also, how are you doing, Sophia? Anything else that can really compare to the taste of a flame grilled Whopper? Over the years, Burger King has been known by its signature taste across all of its burgers, for good reason, too. However, even though currently it is one of the favorites in the lineup of burger chains, it certainly did not start off this way. Unlike the King's clowned mascot competitor, the Burger King story is far from a clean-cut success story. So how did it all happen? In this video, we are taking a look at the story of Burger King. But before we continue, make sure to give this video a thumbs up, subscribe, and hit the bell icon to be the first to be notified of new behind-the-business videos we post every week. Oh my name, just fix Before Burger camera. King was serving up their famous Whoppers, milkshakes, and fries left, right, and center, the chain started off small right in the heart of Jacksonville, Florida. Founded by two men named Keith Kramer and Matthew Burns, who were inspired to start the burger chain when they took a trip to the original McDonald's restaurant in San Bernardino. They were particularly amazed at how customers were able to grab their meals within minutes and got to work opening their own joint. To successfully okay. rival the pace of McDonald's, the duo bought the rights to use a special grill machine called the Insta Broiler in their restaurant, and the restaurant Insta Burger King was born. They sold their burgers and shakes for 18 cents apiece, and people were loving it. Slowly, Kramer and Burns were able to expand their operations and opened up more Insta Burger Kings all across Florida. One of these franchises was in Miami and owned by two. Okay, so good to know for context that this kind of all started with McDonald's, or at least. Uh, Burger King started with McDonald's as in a direct reaction to McDonald's. So I suppose that the true origin of the modern fast food industry will become a lot clearer when we get to McDonald's is the story, I suppose. But yeah, okay. City friends James W. McLemore and David Edgerton, who eventually took over the company in 1954. Two university students, James W. McLemore and David Edgerton, decided that they wanted in on the burger franchise and opened the first Miami outlet. As Miami was still growing at that point in time, it made perfect sense and they quickly found success with their new business. However, the Insta Broiler stove was far from perfect and oftentimes broke down. Not to mention it was a real headache to operate. This frustration pushed Edgerton and McLemore to take matters into their own hands, and they redesigned a new cooking system naming it the Flame Broiler, giving rise to the signature Flame Grilled Burger and also that distinct Burger King taste. However, by 1959, Insta Broiler operation had run into financial troubles and started losing a lot of money. At this point, the two university students, McLemore and Edgerton, decided to step up. Seeing the potential in the undermanaged business, they bought out the entire company and set about making improvements. With the duo at the helm, their first order of business was dropping the Insta and just name. So these guys just decide, hey, the thing this entire business operation is based upon kind of sucks. Let's just redo it regardless of whatever the actual owners like thought or said about it. Not gonna lie, kind of a baller move. It Burger King. They then decided to start expanding their operations and open the first franchisee of Burger King in 1959. Slowly, the fast food chain started to make its way throughout the United States, acquiring more and more customers and gaining brand recognition. In 1963, Burger King went international and opened up an outlet in Puerto Rico and found a large customer base there as well, making the Whopper an international household name. With all this success, it came as no surprise that the Burger King Corporation was acquired by the Pillsbury Company in 1967 for a grand total of $18 million. At this point, the chain already had a total of 200... What's the difference? What's the difference in what, Sophia?
uh, where does this start? It starts up here. The tip already dried. No! Um, if you're referring to the difference between the, the cooking things, um, hold on, actually, let's, we want to go back. Yeah, let's go back. Okay, so they're talking about McDonald's, and then someone made the Insta Broiler. To successfully rival the pace of McDonald's, the duo bought the rights to use a special grill machine called the Insta Broiler in their restaurant, and the restaurant Insta Burger King was born. They sold their burgers and shakes for 18 cents a piece, and people were loving it. Slowly, Kramer and Burns were able to expand their operations and opened up more Insta Burger Kings all across Florida. One of these franchises was in Miami and owned by two university friends, James W. McLemore and David Edgerton, who eventually took over the company in 1954. Two university students, James W. McLemore and David Edgerton, decided that they wanted in on the burger franchise and opened the first Miami outlet. As Miami was still growing at that point in time, it made perfect sense and they quickly found success with their new business. However, the Insta Broiler stove was far from perfect and oftentimes broke down. Not to mention it was a real headache to operate. This frustration pushed Edgerton and McLemore to take matters into their own hands, and they redesigned a new cooking system naming it the Flame Broiler, giving rise to the signature flame grilled burger and also that distinct Burger King taste. However, by 1950 Okay, so the, we didn't get much like visual insight on how the Insta Broiler work, but the Flame Broiler, it seems like <laughs> It's almost like a Ford style, um, uh, with what uh, the assembly line. It's like a just it's just like a conveyor belt over open fire, and that seems to be what the flame broiler is, and that kind of became the the go to Burger King, um, thing. That was the thing that set their burgers apart while maintaining the same speed before. That was the whole point in allowing them to compete with McDonald's. Which, whatever McDonald's old school system was, it had them pumping out burgers faster than anyone else at the time. That's what kind of put them on the map, is my very basic understanding until we get to McDonald's. 59 Insta Broiler operation had run into financial troubles and started losing a lot of money. At this point, the two university students, McLemore and Edgerton, decided to step up. Seeing the potential in the undermanaged business, they bought out the entire company and set about making improvements. With the duo at the helm, their first order of business was dropping the Insta and just naming it Burger King. They then decided to start expanding their operations and open the first franchisee of Burger King in 1959. Slowly, the fast food chain started to make its way throughout the United States, acquiring more and more customers and gaining brand recognition. In 1963, Burger King went international and opened up an outlet in Puerto Rico and found a large customer base there as well, making the Whopper an international household name. With all this success, it came as no surprise that the Burger King Corporation was acquired by the Pillsbury Company in 1967 for a grand total of $18 million. Okay, so two students made it big. They, they turned the business into something worthwhile that a much larger company came in to uh, profit on. Now, let's see if things start changing now that there's a new owner in town, as that's usually what happens, right? You have the smart investors that are like, hey, you had a good thing going, that's why we bought you, and then leaves them alone. And you have the classic ones that, you know, start getting involved thinking they can improve things now that they have the ability to just say what's what. So let, let's see how this goes from this, uh, this marked point. Also 18 million and then what year was this? 1967? Jeez. It's actually was acquired a lot of by money. The Pillsbury Company in 1967 for a grand total of $18 million. 
At this point, the chain already had a total of 274 stores all over the USA. Okay. The number of franchises growing quickly because of Burger King's booming success. And with Pillsbury, the chain was able to grow fast. Which, by the way, for reference, like why I'm like, that's a ton of money at the time. It was in 19, I believe, 72, 73, something like that, that we went off, that Nixon took us off the gold standard. And that's when inflation like really started to hit properly. That's when the um, numerical value of the dollar started uh, dropping like really fast. So we started getting like really big numbers. Um, so that was like five years before that. So that was back when the dollar was individually worth a lot. Um, I back, uh, hold on, let me grab like a quick, like, I should just have an inflation calculator, um, at the ready for this stuff. Let's see. Um, all right. So 1967, right? Oh, there we go. Sup, Samurai? Actually, this is when I used to start my streams all the time, was around 2. It's just I started doing them after uh, dinner because I was doing the programming job, but that, that job's kind of slow right now, but in a good way. Um, I'm still making a ton of money. I'm actually doing great in that regard. Um, all right, so on, let me go back. How much did they buy it for? 18 million? Okay. So 18... Zero, 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 zero. Oh, wait, is it not? Oh, this is like a cost of living calculator. Hold on. No, I want like just a straight inflation calculator. Uh, what? Okay, all right, we'll say January 1967. This one should work. Um, 18, has the same buying power as, ah, oh, this one doesn't go over 10 million either. <laughs> can I just like really, If someone could find me an inflation calculator that could go that can go like over ten million. I suppose I okay, actually, hold on. Let me go back to the other one. Um let me just grab like one. One dollar and then I'll just manually multiply it by eighteen million. 1967, $1 is worth $9.35. Okay. Times 18 million. Okay. Okay. So, for reference, in today's money, Pillsbury bought Burger King for $168,300,000. Okay. They've got they got two hundred and seventy four or something like that Burger King, yeah, two hundred and seventy four Burger King stores for a hundred and sixty eight million thousand dollars. Just for funsies, how much did they? How much did they spend per store? Six hundred and fourteen thousand two hundred and thirty three dollars fifty eight cents per store. Okay. Again, not a small chunk of change. Faster than ever, going head to head with McDonald's to become America's largest burger chain. This was the 1980s when Burger King's operations were taken over by Pillsbury executive Norman Brinker, who was the reason behind the chain's massive success back then. Brinker started okay. what is now known as the Burger Wars, where he channeled all of Burger King's marketing into competing with McDonald's for the spot of America's oh. favorite burger joint. 
The war started off when Burger King released an ad targeting McDonald's for having smaller burgers, claiming that Burger King's flame broiled burgers were the better option. Now obviously, McDonald's wasn't going to let this one go, and actually filed a lawsuit against Burger King for false advertising. Oh, come on. Which was later dismissed. But the okay. ad did what it set out to do. Earn Burger King enough traction in the market to boost their sales. But Burger King was just getting started. The corporation sent its marketing into overdrive, partnering up with companies such as Disney, featuring the characters on their collectible cups. For the record, I actually love it when companies do this stuff. I love it when they like like actually go like properly head to head. <laughs> like when Wendy's was do was it Wendy's was doing that um that smack talk on Twitter. Oh, that was the coolest thing ever. And merchandise. We need more corporate blood sports. That's that's my thinking right now. That's what we need. We need to get that going again. To attract more customers, with their most memorable campaign being partnership with the Star Wars franchise. Some claiming that the promotion on the cups were so good, it actually revealed some spoilers for the movie. One of the reasons was, was the better. fact that they always kept their menu simple, giving the people what they really wanted. With clever menu expansions and additions to their lineup of signature burgers to bring back the chain's older customers once again, Burger King experienced an increase in their sales by 15%, okay. which was a huge feat for the brand back then. Subsequently, yeah. Burger King managed to win over Donald Smith, an ex-restaurant executive for McDonald's, to lead Burger King's operations, and he managed to breathe a brand new life into the company. In 1978, Smith introduced breakfast options on the menu, which led to the launch of Burger King's very successful breakfast menu that now includes waffles, sandwiches, breakfast burritos, and so much more. With constant new additions to the menu, Burger King kept making more and more sales. But with all these new additions to the menu, how did the company manage to retain its affordable prices? Well, right. that's where their operation strategy comes in. Burger King menus have always been engineered to be simple, on-brand, and most of all, profitable. One of their key moves is to only add those items to their menu which can be sourced from the ingredients that are already being used in their kitchens. This way, Burger King has been able to scale their operations sustainably, while also giving their customers a huge range of options to choose from. However, in 1980, Smith left the company and Burger King started to experience a decline in popularity. Because of the company's financial losses, they had to scale back on the construction of new locations, which only worsened the situation. With frequent changes in the management structure of the company, Burger King had to deal with a lot of inconsistency in policies and strategies, which led to a further decline in sales. To rectify the situation, the company started expanding its menu aggressively. But unlike when Smith was in charge, the company wasn't able to scale this expansion the right way, with some items like the Burger King chicken tenders had to face loss because the company just wasn't able to meet the customer demands. Additionally, Burger King also had to pull out several ad campaigns when they realized their products weren't going to work out, leading to losses worth millions of dollars. By 1982, Burger King not only had to compete with McDonald's, but players like Wendy's had also entered the fast food market, giving Burger King more to worry about. Unfortunately, the company ended up adapting its offensive strategy once again and made ads directly targeting McDonald's and Wendy's, claiming that their burgers were unhealthy. As a result, both the companies filed lawsuits against Burger King. Eventually, the situation worsened till Pillsbury had to give in and the company was acquired by the British conglomerate Grand Metropolitan, which in hindsight proved to be a game changer for Burger King. The company changed Burger King's distribution strategies and canceled their contract with Pepsi, signing a new one with Coca-Cola, while also partnering up with Walt Disney to promote any new Disney films at the fast food joint, boosting sales instantly, not just in America, but all over the globe. Yeah, that Barry sounds King like King was, was posted a big as deal. the CEO of Burger King in 1989, and he decided to aggressively focus on international expansion, opening up Burger King in countries like Saudi Arabia, Oman, Peru, New Zealand, and other regions, where they saw the potential for the brand to grow. At the same time, with the help of the company's long-serving co-founder Macklemore, Burger King worked on improving their quality of food and service, which was one of their main problem areas. With fresh management and a new strategy, Burger King had managed to regain its position in the world of fast food, and as a result, the company was able to keep expanding and opening up new franchises all over the world. In 2006, after a long reign, Burger King finally went public, 
generating around $425 million in equity, which was a huge... Wait, wait, wait. They weren't even a publicly traded company this entire time? Yo, that's actually pretty baller, actually. <laughs> that's actually really impressive. I ain't gonna lie. Like they went, what, uh, like 30 years of overall pretty large growth in the whole time they were entirely private. Granted, changing ownership a few times, but still remaining private. Like that's, that's really impressive, actually. Success. And to celebrate their achievement, the company decided to pay homage. All right, so this is the other thing. So getting new owners was kind of an up and down, but overall seemed to mostly work out. Now let's see if things start degrading sharply after being uh, going public, because that's usually the other um, big question as far as like big obvious uh, drop off points. To their iconic Whopper and launch their Whopper Bar concept in select stores, allowing the customer to see their burgers being made, which directly increased their trust in the brand. Constant revamping of their menus and ad campaigns, Burger King managed to gain enough traction to be acquired by 3G Capital, which then merged the burger joint with the Canadian coffee chain Tim Hortons in 2014, leading to both the brands profiting off each other's existing customer bases. Wait, By those two are merged? Burger King what? had officially reclaimed the second spot in the burger war, generating a total of $9.6 billion in sales. Since then, the company has catered to all kinds of customers, going as far as to launch an entirely plant-based version of their iconic Whopper, in collaboration with Beyond Meat, calling it the Impossible Whopper, and increase the company's sales by 10%. Despite going through ups and downs, being sold and bought by so many different firms, Burger King has still managed to come out on top as one of the most successful international fast food chains of all time. The reason why the company managed to do this is that at the end of the day, it kept things simple. First of all, Burger King has always heavily invested in their ad campaigns, which is how they managed to bring in customers and differentiate their brand from all of their competitors. With a recognizable logo and the famous Have It Your Way slogan, Burger King makes sure that its customers know what they're getting when they choose to eat here. With marketing strategies like offering free refills, Burger King delivers on value and has managed to create a loyal fan base that isn't going away anytime soon. Today, Burger King has been operating in over 70 countries with more than 90% of their franchises being privately owned. With tons of other fast food chains making their way to the market, Burger King has still retained its top position. Combining innovative products and impeccable service with some of the smartest marketing tactics in the industry, the story of Burger King's success is nothing short of remarkable. So, what is your favorite Burger King burger? Do leave us a comment down below. As always, if you enjoyed this video, make sure to give it a thumbs up, subscribe, and hit the bell icon to be the first to be notified of new Behind the Business videos we post every week. Be inspired, and we will see you in the next one. Since you made it all the way to this point, here are two more videos that we know you are going to love. Go on, click it. You know you want to. Okay, all right. So, oh, I went to the channel. Give it a second. Okay, so that was uh, Behind the Business, which uh, I'd say was a pretty good video. Um, yeah. Give me a minute to pull up another one here. <laughs> hey, Carter, it's me, Devin. I mean, that's, uh, what is going on with Rumble and Twitter right now? Their streams, KBS is all over the place. Or K, K well, they should be MBPs on. Um, <clears throat> uh, I mean, hey, Devin, um, nice to see you, though I am not Carter. I'm not sure who you were looking for, but <laughs> um, yeah, welcome to the stream anyway. Yeah, I don't know what's going on with Twitter and is Rumble also still having a problem right now? Jeez.
Oh, I mean, dude, no worries. I mean, you're you're welcome to hang out. What is happening with? Rumble thinks I'm still on the opening screen, I guess. I mean, it looks like they're kind of stabilizing. I'm gonna I'm gonna restart the rumble stream here. Twitter, I think, is stabilizing. Okay. Well, oh. huh. Oh, all right. All right. That's better. That's better. Kick is reconnecting. Do I reconnecting? Twitch reconnecting. Uh, oh, all right, so Twitter looks like something. How's Rumble doing? Oh, Rumble looks like a stream. Nice. Uh, d -Live's still reconnecting. How does Kick look? Kick looks like a stream. Nice. YouTube seems good, good. Twitch seems good, nice. Okay, all right, all right. I think we're, I think we're good. I think we're back. Uh, oh yeah, even D Live's going again. Okay, all right. Yeah, something went weird with my Wi-Fi. Uh, I normally have a particular like version of the Wi-Fi I connect to, and that was just not doing anything all of a sudden. I don't know if my dad's like moving stuff around upstairs or what. Oh uh, yeah, let me grab the next uh, thing. I'm going to try to find a few different videos per um, per chain. All right, that seems like a good one. All right, so we watched Burger King come up and do pretty good. And then I got this video here. Yes, the world entertainment. Um, the downfall of the Burger King kingdom. So let's see the other side of the story, I suppose. And if you have specific videos you want me to react to on these topics, and right now it's pretty much anything fast food related, you can use command discord to get to the discord server and Drop the link in React Recommends. There you go. There's all stuff for this video. Um, yes, the world entertainment, the downfall of the Burger King kingdom. Yeah, how does Burger King fall from grace? 
This episode of Yesterworld is sponsored by Current, the future of mobile banking. We'll talk about it more after the episode, but it's a great solution if you've grown tired of all the inconveniences and outdated restrictions of traditional banks. Just go to current.com slash Yesterworld, or check out the link in the description to see what they're all about, and support the channel by signing up today. When it comes to the history of fast food restaurants, there's certainly no shortage of interesting stories. From the downfall of the once insanely popular Burger Chef, Subway's origins as Pete's Super Submarines, and of course the world and characters of McDonald Land. But then you have the Burger King Kingdom and the numerous incarnations of the restaurant's fictional fast food universe. Plus, this horrifying monstrosity. <laughs> Similar to McDonald's, it's a story that spans over 50 years and goes in quite a few unexpected directions. So sit back, relax, and let's take a deep dive into another one of fast food's most iconic and absolutely bonkers- He said the thing. He said deep dive, it's what we're here for, and let's go. Advertising campaigns. The story begins all the way back in 1953 with a hamburger restaurant called Insta Burger King in Jacksonville, Florida. The owners of the establishment were Keith Kramer and Matthew Burns, and their inspiration actually came from a visit to the very first McDonald's in San Bernardino, California. However, unlike McDonald's speedy system that used flat top grills, they used a machine known as the Insta Burger Stove, hence the name Insta Burger King. Another difference between the two burger businesses was their mascot, or lack thereof, as while McDonald's had a half-human, half-burger abomination for theirs, Insta Burger King didn't have one at all. At least, not yet. Enter James McLemore and David R. Edgerton, who just so happened to be- Yo, I gotta say, mid-century advertising as a whole is wild. They- it, the norm back then was some weird stuff by today's standards. That's just bizarre. Which I find fascinating. Friends of the owners and expressed the desire to become Insta Burger King franchisees. But they also had the belief that in order to truly succeed, it was time for the burger franchise to have an official mascot, one that rivaled or surpassed McDonald's Humburger. So they came up with the Burger King, who- Humburger? Oh, I hate everything to do with that. It's, makes me want to know more about it, but also I hate everything to do with that. Humburger. Oh no. It was either incredibly small or somehow produced gigantic hamburgers and milkshakes. The first implementation of the Burger King was in 1954, and additional locations with the new mascot began popping up all over Florida. But you might be wondering, okay, so why isn't Burger King called Insta Burger King today? And if not, I'm gonna tell you anyway. You see, despite the catchy name, the Insta Burger Stove was a headache to use and constantly suffered from mechanical issues, so Edgerton and McLemore developed a completely new cooking system. This innovation was called the flame boiler, as instead of cooking in an oven, the burgers were transported over gas flames on a chain-link conveyor belt. Going even further, the new cooking device wound up giving the patties a distinct grill line, and though completely unintentional, this also made the burgers stand out among the competition, aka McDonald's. But more importantly was the introduction of the Whopper in 1957, as while well double the price of a McDonald's burger, it was also quite larger and far more filling. So the word Insta was taken off the title of the restaurant, and due to the popularity of the Whopper, they simply became Burger King, home of the Whopper. Anyway, the original owner sold the company to Edgerton and McLemore in 1959, and that's when profits truly began to soar. But the real meat of our story begins in 1967, as the franchise was sold once again, but this time to the it Pillsbury Company. Hi, I'm Poppin' Fresh, the Pillsbury Doughboy. Hi. Out of cookies? Okay, that's when you know when you have a good mascot, because they still got that guy today. Let's make some. Hey, you guys. Oh, my nose! Quick fun fact. <laughs> wait, 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 what? <laughs> oh. Hey, you guys. <laughs> Quick fun fact, the Pillsbury Doughboy's original name was going to be Jonathan Pillsbury and was also voiced by Paul Fries, aka the Haunted Mansion ghost host. Now as strange as it sounds, Wait, the Pillsbury Doughboy actually played a pretty major part of the evolution of the Burger King. You see, the 1960s and 70s was the boom of companies using animated mascots to advertise their products on television, specifically to children. 
Cereal commercials and sugary snacks were by far the most popular, in which adorable characters were mixed with humorous skits to drive up sales. So as an attempt by Pillsbury to capitalize on this growing television marketing fad, they came up with the adorable Pillsbury Doughboy and his equally adorable TV spots. Of course, the campaign was a huge success, so when Pillsbury got their hands on Burger King, they desired to do something very similar. But much like what they were also doing with the lovable Doughboy, they also wanted to merchandise Burger King's mascot. The problem right. was that the original design for the Burger King himself was a bit off-putting and not super merchandise-friendly. So together with a new logo and tagline, he was given a complete redesign to appear much more like a television cartoon character. No, I said television character, not terrifying character. But your time will come. Here's the Burger King himself. Your Highness, exactly what is it you go to Burger King for? Lunch. Uh, yes, but I mean, is it the Whopper? Thank you. Or the fries? Don't mind if I do. Burger King. Where kids like kids. The beginning of now, the these trend animated of Burger just King television ads were pretty straightforward, with, in which reporters yeah. were featured shenanigans with fantasy characters. Though to be fair, this is based on just two examples, as unlike the countless early McDonald's commercials, these are exceptionally hard to find online. I mean, I literally spent hours upon hours pouring through 60s and 70s television ads, but I only found these two, so the rest of their storylines are a bit of a mystery, or how many there actually were. Adding to the mystery was a redesign of the character in 1972, so I have to imagine there's even more commercials featuring this iteration. Now since it does tie into our story later, it's also worth mentioning the restaurant's live-action promotions, or more specifically the slogan, Have It Your Way. You see, this was a sort of slap in the face to McDonald's, as when it came to food options and special requests, they were pretty unflexible. What am I, a mind reader? Ah, uh, from now on, I just don't care. However, with Burger King, patrons were encouraged to, well, have it their way, with a much wider selection of condiments and toppings. But McDonald's influences would soon go beyond just Burger King's food offerings, as the 1970s was also the height of McDonald land. Get yourself ready for a trip through McDonald land. Take along a friend and grab a hold of Ronald's hand. Now for those unaware, we extensively covered the entire history of McDonald's. This would not fly today. <laughs> it was a very different time back then. Oh. I have to admit, I'm not looking forward to trying to paint any of the words of this logo. But, I mean, as far as shapes, I'd say this is coming along nicely thus far. And in a previous episode. So if you haven't already, maybe give it a watch after this one. And while you're at it, subscribe to the channel. But for the purposes of this episode, all you need to know is that it was McDonald's promotional campaign starring Ronald McDonald. They were also filled to the brim with other McDonald's food-centric characters, featuring all kinds of shenanigans that usually revolved around a particular menu item. What's the matter, Mr. McCheese? The McDonald Land cookie machine! It's making the delicious cookies upside down, you know! The campaign was incredibly successful, and a pop culture phenomenon, so it should be no surprise that the rival Burger King wanted to do something very similar. Enter Tony Hassini, founder of the International Magician Society and a well-respected magician himself. You see, in 1976, okay. he had the idea for a television campaign, one that would feature a magical character performing on-screen magic tricks. So he pitched the idea to Burger King, and together with their desire of competing with McDonaldland, a new iteration of the Burger King was born. Uh, well, this is awkward. I wasn't referring to you. But we'll get there. My promise. Introducing that king of fun. The one who's okay with us kids. The Magic Burger King. That was a line. In person. Yeah. I'm the marvelous magical Burger King. I can do most anything. Now watch me kids when I twist my ring like magic. We're at Burger King. The first of Burger King's new magic-centric okay, television enough. commercials appeared in 1977 and introduced the marvelous magical Burger King. As the whimsical name implies, the revitalized mascot was now a magician, although most of his powers seemed to be limited to Burger King menu items. The vast majority of the magic tricks were performed in camera, thanks to the talents of Tony Hassini, and the rest were achieved using Thumbnails fire, I will have just put degeneracy in other words. <laughs> no, the part that I need that I need people to grab onto is the corporate bit. 
I want to get all the people mad about corporations in here. Also, sorry, you missed the very big numbers earlier. Apparently, Burger King first started taking off when they were bought by Pillsbury for $18 million, but that was in 1967, so having redone the math, um, actually turns out to be like $168 million. Also, Rumble... I can't I can't actually tell if it's really my internet or just rumbles just having a real hard time today. Yeah, I don't know what that was about. Anyway, okay. I, I think we're good now. We should be good now. Um Sai, if you're having chat problems, you know you can I'm back on Twitch, right? <laughs> you can go back to Twitch chat if you want. That's the thing. Alright, that's gonna be fun to edit later, but yeah, whatever. It's fine. It's fine. Oh, wait. I'm getting comfortable. I need my mini back. Eh. Er. Okay. Yeah, it's just easy to cast stream through YouTube. Oh, yeah, no worries, man. Just let you know. Okay. All right. Let's get back to this giant wooden block, I guess. I don't remember why this is on screen, but okay. Let's just go, we'll go back a little bit. Scott was now a magician, although most of his powers seemed to be limited to Burger King menu items. The vast majority of the magic tricks were performed in camera, thanks to the talent. What do you think his powers are going to be mostly based on? I mean, did you want him to start? I don't even know. Like, you want to start, like, casting fireballs or something? I, actually, that, that would still... You, you could just use that to cook the burgers, actually. Yeah. He is nitpicking hardcore. Yeah, right? <laughs> well, okay, to be fair, the first video I watched was pretty positive on Burger King. Like, they, they went through, like, the basic business story, and, like, it kind of ended on a pretty happy note. So now I'm trying to get a little bit on the other side, right? Um, but, uh, but yeah, uh, like, what did you think the Burger King's, like, powers would be based on? Oh, maybe they'd be based on fast food that would be crazy <laughs> of tony hassini and the rest were achieved using special effects and editing techniques i'm up here kids but don't give up hope i'll be right down with also was he i was going comment but you're not in streamer voice i am in stream voice what are you talking about i'm in stream voice oh sorry i jumped in the wrong one i jumped in the patreon streaming voice yeah i don't even know why i still have a is that working right now? Oh, uh, hold on. I think my Discord settings are weird. Oh, wait. Nope. There we go. Haha. -ha. Um, this headset's got a thing where actually it's it mutes when I put the arm up. It says you're constantly broadcasting side, but no sounds coming through. Oh, actually, that might be on me. Let me double check. I'll put device. A real like people when they weren't now going we like he's a real magician. You couldn't hear me at all before? No, nothing. But we're good now. Uh -oh. <laughs> they're, they're, they're passing it. They're, he's trying to criticize it as if it's like David Blaine doing an actual performance. Like they were try they were at no point trying to pass off this as being a real magician thing happening. Actually, no point was hold that on. what was happening. Hold but on. he's criticizing as if that's what's happening. <laughs> Actually, it was. <laughs> oh, let me go back. Let me go back. Mm -hmm. I doubt you know the cam. Oh, oh yeah, you you need me to stream the video for you. That's just do the thing. Let's do the thing we tested last night. See, it's already coming into play. <laughs> I'm You're echoing it on the, the Discord on your, so. too, like we tested the other day. Yeah, that's literally so what I'm saying. It. Yeah. Hold. I got like three hours before I have a work session. Nice, nice. So if I share... once it gets canceled last second again, you know it's going on. <laughs> I had like all last week off because of last second cancellations. There we go. All right, let me make sure my audios are balanced. Campaign was incredibly successful and a pop culture phenomenon, so it should be no surprise that the rival Burger King wanted to do something very similar. Enter Tony Hassini, founder of the International Magician Society and a well-respected magician himself. 
You see, in 1976, he had the idea for a television campaign, one that would feature a magical character performing on-screen magic oh, tricks. Someone? So he pitched the idea to Burger King. Yeah, so they actually were literally so trying to pass it off as real magic tricks. <laughs> oh, they were trying to pass it off as real magic tricks? Okay, this is kind of warranted then. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, I think the them only being based on menu items, I think that's not an unfair criticism because it's yeah, literally well, for advertising Burger King. Like, what did you think he was going to do? I mean, but it's, it's, it does sound, it kind of sound like this guy's criticizing him. Like, he didn't use actual magic. This is <laughs> absurd. <laughs> like, it's like, well, what do you expect? Are you, are you expecting him to actually use magic? <laughs> like, the yeah. little shit at stage. I mean, okay. <laughs> All is. <laughs> also, the name of the video is The Downfall of the Burger King Kingdom. <laughs> like, it's it's a bit of, <laughs> it's, it's a little on the doomer end of the light which is why I picked it to balance out the very positive video I watched before, you know, gotta get both sides of the story. So let's, let's see, let's see all of the criticisms, right? King, and together with their desire of competing with McDonald Land, a new iteration of the Burger King was born. Uh, Chad. well, this is awkward. I wasn't referring to you, but we'll get there. I promise. Introducing that King of Fun. Okay, that that's a weird line. I said that earlier. He's okay with us kids. Like, what does that mean? Like, wait, what? They stole this shit from SpongeBob. They stole this shit from SpongeBob. Like, Magic Burger King in person. Yay! I'm the marvelous magical Burger King. I can do most anything. Now watch me, kids, when I twist my ring like magic. We're at Burger King. The first of Burger King's new magic-centric television fired. commercials appeared in 1977 and introduced the marvelous magical Burger King. As the whimsical name implies, the revitalized mascot was now a magician, although most of his powers seemed to be limited to Burger King menu items. The vast majority of the magic tricks were performed in camera, thanks to the talents of Tony Hassini, and the rest were achieved using special effects and editing techniques. I'm up here, kids, but don't give up hope. I'll be right down with my magic rope. I love magic and uh -oh. food that's fun. Fun, 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 fun for everyone. Now, I wouldn't blame you for last thinking, Dale played with a magic okay, rope this, this doesn't seem that them. similar to McDonald Land, and at first it wasn't. But then came the other characters a year or so later to join the Burger King, and that's when these promotions became very no suspiciously McDonald's Land-esque. There was the Duke of Doubt, who was convinced that the Burger King's magic was fake, Usopp? and frequently tried to oust him as a fraud. See the okay. fucking Usopp, no way. That's actually pretty funny that uh, they, they were like, let's just get a uh, uh, contrarian, <laughs> like... they had a cast. Where's, um... I never they knew they had a cast window. like McDonald's has the, the cast with the, the the fucking Ronald McDonald and Grimace and all them. I didn't know Burger King also had a cast of fucking characters. Honestly, it's pretty funny. Um, I'm like here for it. Honestly, I don't know. Play. This I want to play. I want to play devil's advocate here. I, this, I think this commercial's fucking fire so far. I think this is a fire ass commercial. I think this is an awesome commercial. It's I, catchy. Yeah. It's live action. They put work into the costumes. Like Imagine if you saw commercials like that today. I mean, if you released this exact commercial today, this guy who is in the costume would be canceled for being a pedophile, but like, Yeah, just off that that one <laughs> yeah. line. He's okay with us kids. Like, wait, what does that mean? <laughs> No, but like the general, the general it concept. Was normal to find it was normal to find children fucking annoying back in the day. So he was the only adult okay with being <laughs> around them. <laughs> Everyone else found them annoying, and they they just told him back then they would just be like, "Hey, you're annoying. Leave me alone." Nowadays, you can't just tell a kid they're annoying. <laughs> Unless you're on Xbox then. Live. <laughs> True, but then, then it's just kids telling kids that they're annoying. You didn't play enough of Xbox Live when it first started when the only people that oh, were consistently on it were actually like late teens, oh, yeah. early 20s, and just telling yeah, squeakers, like, shut Trust up. Trust me, I, I, was, I, was the, I was one of the squeakers in that era. 
Oh, and then I, I was, was a one little that... kid playing like Modern Warfare Two, uh, com- Halo Combat Evolved, and like Halo Two, Three, and Reach. Playing uh, Modern Warfare One, Two, and Black Ops One and Two. Okay, for reference, Minecraft I was one of the older kids telling the, you, the to "Shut bar. up, Squeaker." <laughs> For the first like year I played Call of Duty, I only played it for the zombies modes. Because I, mean, I played Black Ops games yeah. before I played the Modern Warfare games. Oh, that's so weird to me. You know when I started was- playing Call of Duty, Call of Duty Two. <laughs> oh, true. I did all. I had I had Call of Duty like four, like one of the first Call of Duties. I no, 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 not four, two. <laughs> Yeah, but I had Call of Duty 4 on my Nintendo DS. In fact, I still have the cartridge sitting around here somewhere. Interesting. Uh, no, like, I, I was playing Call of Duty 2 on PC, like, when it was the it. current game. Like, I remember when Call of Duty 3 came out, and everyone was like, meh. <laughs> Call of Duty 3 was pretty much... Though it did have one, like, pretty... At least, like, in my understanding, it became a pretty iconic line of there was this there was this moment in the campaign because I think it was just campaign. I don't think there was any multiplayer. Um, there was just this one soldier that just like screamed the top of his lungs, Emma! <laughs> just just like ripping his lungs out. And like of course, like the joke is like, great. Right, well, now, like literally everyone knows that that area is out of ammo. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, so Jimmy. I sent the the image to, to the, the, the streaming voice chat. I, I just have this sitting on my desk. <laughs> I've had it on my desk for years and years and years. I don't know. It's just like a little little desk thing I have. I don't know, like a display thing, I guess. I don't not really. It kind of sits in a pile of trash until I throw everything else around it away. <laughs> Oh, okay. And then I'm like, I can't throw this away. I keep thinking about maybe buying Call of Duty 2 on Steam to replay the campaign. The campaign was fire. Don't don't bother, bro. Just get a fucking Xbox emulator and go download the game. That sounds like work, and I already do work to have money, so I cannot work on other things. <laughs> I mean, I guess. <laughs> That's why you get money, so you can pay for things for instead of putting dollars. effort into it. That's, that's literally the True. point. <laughs> It was like uh, it was like last week. I was like, I had just got over being sick, like like the day before, like the last symptoms went away, and it was my day for dinner, and I was like, you know what? I'm exhausted, and uh, I don't want to cook. Know, I, I, I'm gonna order Chinese for everyone. Yeah, it's gonna cost me like hundred and thirty dollars, but I got four meals out of it, and I didn't have to cook yeah. because it's literally the point of money is to not have to do things you don't wanna. You ever just get a a family like box deal from uh, Panda Express to feed you for the whole day? No, because we don't have Panda Express here. <laughs> you don't have Panda Expresses out there, unfortunate. I mean, it's not that you're not missing out that much. It's an okay fast food place. It's not bad, but it's also not like, oh boy, I need Panda Express right now. You know? Yeah. It's an okay option. Once how? I call of duty two. I have Steam open right now. I'm curious how much it actually costs. Uh it usually sits around twenty bucks. Uh occasionally it'll go down to like five. It's twenty bucks right I've now. I've been kind of waiting for it to hit I was like five say, bucks again. Forty bucks for that game is crazy. That is crazy. Yeah. It is not worth forty dollars. In fact, it is twenty dollars right now. I would pay maybe three bucks for this max. Again, why Maybe I three. keep waiting until it hits five because I've seen it hit five before when they do the crazy sales. Yeah, they do. They do the four yearly sales. <clears throat> I was really curious before exactly who decides Steam sales and what games go on the sale. Uh, because on one hand, you would assume that it's the curator of the game or the person who put it on Steam at least, right? But I find it hard to believe that so many games that are just long abandoned, like shit that came out in like the early 2000s, hardly touched by anybody, no player base, abandoned projects. I you doubt like those you? people no. are going on. <laughs> Steam. I doubt that that indie creator who made that one game 20 years ago <laughs> and hasn't touched it since is going on Steam eight times a year and putting in a different sale <laughs> manually for their game. I find that hard to believe. I find that hard to believe. You just completely like drove right over that, that comment. You didn't even acknowledge it. I didn't even hear what you said. Oh, I said, <laughs> you mean like you, an abandoned 2000s project with no players? 
Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> but but it's like I find it hard to believe that. But then on the other hand, what if you release the game for like like twenty bucks? Like you're an indie developer. I release a game for twenty bucks, and then Steam has some giant sale, and without consulting me, they just put my game on the sale automatically with their price which is like the other hand of what happens because i don't see all those creators putting those sales in manually and then a fuck ton of people buy my game for two dollars uh it's and then probably nobody buys in, it afterwards uh, i just missed out on so much money because yeah. it would have been sold at twenty dollars but steam put it on some sale i didn't like agree to yeah no that's gotta be in the fine but on place. the other hand if you agree to it every single time i don't see that being the case because there's so there's like tens of thousands of games that are completely abandoned that still get put on sales 12 13 times a year at different prices yeah i don't see them being the one who does it so who makes the decision for these steam sales no, just some random How is steam it decided? executive like some some business marketing guy i looked it up it's all based on an algorithm so that you makes know sense. When you have the your discovery queue, so if you go to Steam and then you go to store, you can see one of the options is discovery queue, which mm -hmm. essentially just shows you one game after another uh, and then tell, asks you, do you like this game? Is this a game you'd be interested in? And then you can hit like, oh, I'll follow it or I'll put it on my wish list or I'll ignore it or I'll even dislike it. And then yeah. it like goes to the next thing on your queue based on this. So it can kind of like generate. And it probably games waits like. until but a certain ratio. That. Yeah, it, it takes that. And then the games that have the most wood plays get put on those yearly, uh, those four times a year sales. That makes sense. And then all other sales sense. are yeah. by the curator uh, and by the curator alone. Okay. Some curators, though, however, can sign up to automatically be put on all available Steam sales. So you can just check a box when you upload the game to be on all Steam sales whenever they come up forever okay. now. That makes total sense, actually. I pro like honestly, if if someone were to ask me to design that system, I probably would come up with like the same system. Yeah. But, but but then you also have to like qualify. So it's like if you you check that box, and then you have to be one of the games that people are actually looking at playing right, to get put on right. sale. If everyone's hitting ignore or not interested in it, then you're not going to get put on sale. Yeah. At least not in the four giant yearly sales. Man, we're getting like a two for one today. We're going to deep dive fast food and Steam's marketing strategy. Yeah, <laughs> I was just so curious about this the other day because I was like, there's so many games that are so old. Who decides this shit? Yeah, well, hey, that's kind of what we're like now doing a lot on stream, if you didn't notice. I mean, Actually, also, Steam I is having another night. sale right now. They're doing the Steam VR Fest, December 4th uh, through the 11th. That sounds awesome. If only I had VR. <laughs> right? <laughs> That's exactly what I thought. That'd be great if only I had VR. If yeah. only the only good VR systems that are worth the price weren't standalone systems that had proprietary game markets. Cough, cough, Oculus Quest. Yeah. We'll get there. We'll get there eventually. It's only, it's a matter of time. Yeah. I mean, unless VR dies entirely, but I don't really see that being likely. It's just kind of a matter no, of time no. for, like, the general, like, technology to break into the greater VR is, VR is definitely going to become the whole new norm, you know? Yeah. Like, right now, the whole new norm is having, like, your own console or your own PC in your bedroom to play the high-level games on. Back in the day, the norm was going to an arcade. Yeah. Uh, and then the norm became hooking up your Xbox, three, your Xbox 360s through cable links with a whole bunch of buddies in your living room. Now the norm oh, is this. Eventually, the norm is just going to become no. VR. <laughs> <laughs> the kids are going to be running around being like, how did you used to get any entertainment from video games that were on a 2d screen and the and the a anime or sorry the npcs could only say a few lines to you and their lines weren't all ai generated like they are now <laughs> like and the answer is by strangling squeakers like you with our lane cables no <laughs> i have a lot of squeaker problems anyway uh i haven't saw about that motherfuckers 20 years from now we're gonna look at stardew valley and be like how is this entertaining and then That's they, me. I'm one of those motherfuckers. I'm looking at it now, look, thinking how it's going to be entertaining. I'm looking at it now, like, what the fuck? <laughs> um, okay, look at the stream screen real quick. I'm supposed to Yo. write Burger King in between there. I don't know how I'm going to do this. <laughs> in between where? It's catching up. It's catching up. 
I'm sure you're going to point it out in a moment. Uh, that's supposed you to be the Burger uh, King logo right oh, I there. See. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. You need the uh, <sighs> the insanity brush. Yeah. You Wait, know the insanity? I have... I don't have that. But you I do have... have I should have a brand new size zero in here. I'm currently using a size one. I should have a size zero. It's like brand new. So it might I think it's called like it's, I think it's Army Painter brand, the Army Painter Insanity brush that has like three hairs in it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I have, have a I have a really old um, size like zero slash ten from uh, from. Oh, it's actually yeah. It's my, a monument. My it's a monument hobby. Size and neg- synthetic. It's a size and negative one. It's like an X. It took a, a, a needle and stabbed a hole it's in like the end X of the plastic. Ten and there's like maybe. I don't know, like a dozen bristles on this thing. I have a smaller one here. I think I threw it away. Because I actually, I went through, I went through my brushes uh, over the break. Because I actually, I finally did. I bought like a makeup brush set for like dry brushing, and it took up like a whole half of my brush storage in my little carrying thing or whatever. Um, no, no joke. Do you have so like zero. a sewing kit? Because uh, when I, when I watched no. a video a while ago on how to do this extremely tiny like microscopic lettering, and they used a sewing needle and essentially just did like a dot method uh-huh. until it looked like a solid line, just tapping it. Very, it took a oh, while, yeah. but it, it did work. Really um, well. No, but I've got needle like stuff that could work. Anything that would have like a needle like tip where you can just put the tiniest little speck of paint. Yeah, and then he, he just sat there poking it for like maybe. 15 minutes straight before like, I got the word. I don't know what this is from, honestly. I don't know where I got this, but it's a thing I have. Uh, oh, wait. Hold on. Oh, this is the end of a guitar string. I don't know how it took me so long to like, refigure this out. This is the end of a guitar string. I don't know why I, ke- oh, why I kept this, but yeah, this bit right here is like super sharp. <laughs> it looks like an acupuncture needle almost. Yeah, right? Yeah. No, just it. Like I just found it on my desk one day. I was like, I don't know what this is, but I'll, I'll find a use for it. And I threw it in with my other like miscellaneous like painting tools. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it looks like a, maybe a um, D string. It looks like a D string, but a G string. No, a G, no, G's a fair no. bit bigger. But anyway, um, I was referring to a different kind of D. Yeah, string. I know. It's <laughs> listen the 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 tism. <laughs> I, I I started watching the early episodes of One Piece again just so I can get back on the pacing with my my work sessions. That's right. That's right. I found a, a word uh, I can call watching One Piece work. That's right. I mean, Fuck I'm you. painting toys uh, for. And I, I remembered that One Piece just has a lot of stupid animals in the islands, just just stupid animals. And so I grabbed a few. Here's a uh, a squiger. It's a squirrel tiger. Isn't it just like a squirrel? I sent, I'm sending these photos to the of the icons I used for the game in the streaming voice thing chat. Here's of what I called a Vanderflea. Definitely a word I just made up on the spot when I looked at it. Now I gotta figure out put these on screen so anyone actually watching has any idea what the, you know. You know, it's like an show, audience. You gotta show them yeah, the right? squiger. <laughs> you gotta show them the. You gotta show them the squiger. It's great. <laughs> the the party captured one and are trying to tame it as a pet. But yeah, what Beast World just has a lot of stupid animals on the island that are like combo animals huh. and stuff. Anyway, okay. Um, and they're just casually there. All right. So while I'm trying to figure out this new painting method, like it kind of makes sense to paint just dries extremely quickly. Um, let's continue with the Burger King video though. Yeah. Because like at some point I'm I'm going to edit these into like actual videos and like, geez, <laughs> this one's been a little rocky. Even before you came in, I was having internet problems. <laughs> Here, just do some giant waving motion in the camera now so you know when you're editing that that's when you need to cut to. It's like, <laughs> just like wave your hand in the air. Oh, I'm imagining the, the, the audio wave file will just become way more consistent <laughs> all of a sudden. <laughs> they spike, spike, nothing, nothing, spike, spike, and then an... <laughs> it's like, oh, someone talking in like a regular <laughs> modulated voice. Like, that's crazy. Cut commentary, but you just I'll cut change it to fry. Words, right? I doubt what to cut commentary but you just cut between every three words <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
through. Now, if you're like me and he gives you a severe case of the eebie-jeebies, it's more than likely because he bears an uncanny resemblance to the horrifying child catcher from the movie Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. Here we are, children. Come and get your lollipop. There was also Sir Shake a lot, what? who had an unhealthy obsession with Burger King's milkshakes and was always shivering due to how cold they are. At least that's the official reason, as I'm pretty sure he was just in a constant state of milkshake withdrawal. If you're making shake, I'll order one. Another character was the Wizard of Fries, who was, was a robot quite literally powered by French fries, with the power to multi-fry and duplicate them endlessly. Finally, there was the burger th I, I figured he was going to say that the guy was always uh, on like an extreme like sugar high. That's why he was shaking. <laughs> Nah, he just has Tourette's. <laughs> <laughs> they found I mean, a good, good role for him. You know? No, you can't play him shaking again after I said that. You can't. You can't. He's always shivering due to how cold they are. At least that's no. the official reason, as I'm pretty sure he was just in a constant state of milkshake withdrawal. If you're making shake, Tourette's I'll order one. Another, another character was the Wizard of Fries, who was a... <laughs> Oh, well, Matt Stinger, like, the character just, like, randomly just yells out, MILKSHAKE! Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> this is cursed. <laughs> just like, SHAKE IT! MILKSHAKE! MILKSHAKE! Uh, uh, SHAKE THE cream. KILL ME! MILKSHAKE! This is terrible. <laughs> this is super cursed. The robot quite literally powered by french fries, with the power to multi-fry and duplicate them endlessly. Finally, there was the burger thing, which was, car that ran honestly I'm not thing. entirely sure, but something along the lines of a living hamburger painting. <laughs> it's a shake a lot! I doubt it! Did he just get hung? Okay. Wait, he might have. Hold on. Um, I was about to say, okay, the needle thing is like a cool idea but i can't seem to get it to work because the paint in the very tip of it dries like instantly because it's so small oh yeah all right seems like a skill issue if i'm being honest well i don't know <laughs> if like the you know what go, if, if i go okay the more i think about if i add some like flow improver which will keep it from drying as quickly that uh might help let me try some this stuff. YouTuber was actually, it was a fake tutorial. They were lying and it was all photo editing the whole time. They just wanted to see if anyone was stupid enough to actually try it. <laughs> you know what's crazy? <laughs> um, that's, so not, that's not actually out of the realm of possibility. Like stuff like that has happened before. <laughs> so funny. Um, the people, fake painting tutorial teaching you a was, technique that just doesn't work and pretending like it does through editing. Uh, that's so oh, funny. Wh what's his name? Um, there's actually a big, uh, Warhammer painter Ninja? guy. Oh, Squidmar. Squidmar, which is one of the biggest yeah. painting channels on YouTube, right? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, I watched the shit out of him back in the day. Yeah, he released a video a little while ago of, like, it was, like, top ten, like, misinformations we used to spread or something like that. Of just going back through, like, the whole log and being like, alright, so, like, here, I, like, either I didn't know better or I was, like sort of kind of lying or like you know like basically like debunking himself <laughs> mm -hmm. so like yeah that's not um but no there's been other um i don't remember a lot of them they were a long time ago but yeah there's been there's been a, f a couple controversies over the uh over the years yeah mini act deserved the band stuff. all right moving on <laughs> i because mini act deserved the band moving on uh, yeah yeah <laughs> I, that's a legitimately like a hard question for me because I kind of like the guy, but like I don't know, sometimes he's kind of out of pocket. <laughs> shake, sir, shake a lot. Great, shake. Oh yeah, did, did he just get like hung? That's the painting. question. Why is the the one who went up and the evil guy is the one who landed in the gym? Oh wait, no, the evil guy is the one. How about a shake, sir, shake a lot. Great, Oh no, okay, he just now unlike the massive line of McDonald Land merchandise. And by massive, I mean covering virtually all forms of retail, the Burger King Kingdoms was pretty bare bones. Most were simply tied to restaurant promotions, and even those were few and far between. 
So despite the production of over 200 television commercials, it seems that Burger King's fictional world and characters never quite took off in the same way McDonald's did. However, when it came to the two restaurants' non-fantasy promotions, they both gave each other a true run for their money yeah, and was, was honestly pretty shocking to by today's standards. One of the more shameless examples was the Burger King Magic Meal, which just so happened honestly, to appear less than two years after the McDonald's they Happy Meal. Do now would be a boxing match between the Ronald McDonald and the the King, the Burger King. I mean, like a, I... a public like boxing match, huge advertised like some Logan, like some Jake Paul's advertised level shit of the the Burger King versus the the McDonald's guy. It doesn't matter who wins. I guarantee you that's going to be the best advertising they could manage right now. <laughs> I mean, I actually said earlier that, like, I love when the um, advertising, like, actually go after each other, like corporate blood sport. I love it. Now you're yeah. making it actual blood sports. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to see them actually come to fucking blows. I want to watch them beat the shit out of each other for oh, who's the better burger place. I was like, I just pulled that brush out and put it in the tray. Like, where was it? And I found it. All right. Yeah, right, I'm going to be back. Yeah, okay. But unlike McDonald's, the Magic Meal's title was interchangeable, as it then became the Jet Age Meal, followed by the Thundercats Meal, and then the Silverhawks Meal. So basically whatever toy they were selling, plus the word meal at the end. Conversely, due to the success of Burger King's Star Wars campaign, McDonald's began to also do movie tie-ins, especially with their kids' meals, such as Star Trek The Motion Picture. Adding to the rivalry was an ad campaign in 1982, in which Burger King made fast food history by attacking McDonald's and their food offerings by name. There it is. When I order a regular burger at McDonald's, they make it with 20% less meat than Burger King. Unbelievable. Luckily, I know a perfect way to show McDonald's how I feel. I go to Burger King. You see, making vague comparisons yeah. to competing restaurants wasn't anything new, but specifically attacking their products, prices, and food offerings was. The most infamous were a set of commercials starring a very young Sarah Michelle Gellar, which insinuated that McDonald's burgers contained 20% less meat than Burger King's. The Big M then actually wound up suing Burger King on the grounds of slander, misleading claims, and damages. However, as a quick side note, this wasn't the first time Burger King made some iffy statements about their products. It actually goes all the way back to the introduction of the Whopper in 1957, as they claimed it was, quote, an exclusive Burger King creation. The problem was that at least a year prior, there was already a burger restaurant called the Whopper Shop in the state of Michigan. Even more damning was a Texas fast food what? chain called the Whopper Burger Drive-In. So not cool, Burger King, not cool. Anyway, okay. the McDonald's right. case with BK was eventually settled out of court, at least for 20% less meat debacle, as they continue to produce even more- Sorry, are you like punching weird audio that you are punching? Okay, I'm gonna just, I'm gonna let that sound on me for a little while. <laughs> okay. More slanderous commercials, and even dealt some low blows to Wendy's. At this time, we'd like to offer our sympathy to McDonald's and Wendy's. Now back to the Burger King kingdom, <laughs> because of the 1990s approach, the marvelous magical uh. Burger King campaign was failing to drive up sales among children. I mean, seriously, would you want to go to a restaurant who had a mascot that resembled a guy named the Child Catcher? I think not. <laughs> so rather than rework the McDonaldland esque world and characters, they decided yeah, to abandon them like altogether in favor of a different approach. The idea was to, surprise, surprise, copy McDonald's once again, or more specifically, the synergy between their fictional characters and restaurant offerings. But unlike McDonald's, their new campaign wouldn't be a bunch of bizarre non-human characters, but something that would actually be relatable to kids. No, I said relatable to kids, not terrifying to kids. But we'll get to you soon enough. This dude really has a problem with the chain. Yeah. It's actually Why not fine. pop over to Burger King and find out how to join the kids club? Yo, I remember this. Details are specified in the kids club newsletter. The Burger King Kids Club officially debuted in December of 1989, and from a marketing standpoint, it really was quite the elaborate endeavor. As I mean, far I as the group it itself, later. there was KidVid, who was obsessed with video games and technology, and was by far the most prominently featured. 
There was also Boomer, a sports-loving tomboy who by okay, my Boomer. accounts was the second most featured within the group. Then there was IQ and Snaps, a stereotypical nerd and a photography-passionate blonde. As a way to bring some diversity into the group was Jaws, a black male with an insatiable appetite. Last but not least was Wheels, a paraplegic who, come to think of it, he was just kind of there. And in hindsight, even the nickname Wheels is pretty insensitive, as if he's entirely defined by his disability. Not cool, Burger King. Not cool. Okay, that's... It's Leo, the new kid. He's the fastest one in town. I'm looking for some breakfast. Seen any? A year or so later, after the group was founded, came JD the dog in Lingo, a quote, Hispanic who loved art. The kid, not the dog. But the Burger King Kids Club was more than a group of fictional kids to promote food offerings, as they were part of an actual kids club, one that children could actually join. On top of receiving an official membership card, every year on their birthday, members got a special packet with games and a coupon for a free kids meal. Inside the store itself was the Kids Club Adventures magazine, which was essentially a free pamphlet featuring games, puzzles, and trivia, along with information covering upcoming movies and merchandise. However, one of the most nostalgic elements of the Kids Club were, of course, the toys. And as strange as it sounds, it actually began with Disney and McDonald's. Now when you buy a $5 book of McDonald's well, yeah, gift certificates, you get a free kitchen. plush musical ornament of Oliver or Dodger, the characters from the new Disney movie Oliver and Company. You see, in the 1980s, McDonald's became Disney's go-to fast food chain for restaurant tie-ins, especially in association with the Happy Meal. But then came the live-action film Dick Tracy, in which based on Disney's confidence they'd be a massive hit, McDonald's put together a rather expensive and elaborate ad campaign. Unfortunately, Dick Tracy down, drastically uh, underperformed at the box office, and the campaign wound up being a massive bottom, flop, bottom, costing McDonald's quite a bit financially. So when it came to the prospect of future Disney promotions, McDonald's kind of noped out of their partnership with the mouse. However, Burger King was more than happy to take their place, as it would also give them a chance to broaden their kids' meal toys beyond just TV shows. This was more or less like winning the fast food lottery, as the Disney Renaissance era was just around the corner. And though it technically began with The Little Mermaid, and some might even say The Great Mouse Detective, Beauty and the Beast solidified it. Burger King invites you to meet the stars from Walt Disney's Beauty and the Beast. Now in theaters, there's Belle and the Beast, Cogsworth, and Chip. You can collect all four at Burger King, a new one each week when you buy a kid's meal. Much like the film, the toy integration with BK was incredibly profitable, both for the restaurant and Disney. This was followed by another successful campaign with The Little Mermaid's VHS release. After that was another lucrative promotion with Aladdin, and for this one the fast food franchise went all out. But then came a little movie called The Lion King, which made the success of the prior Disney integrations pale in comparison. Celebrates the Lion King now in theaters with Lion King size values, like our $1.99 hamburger kids meal with a Lion King toy featuring Disney's newest stars. The Lion King promotion at BK was so popular that it tripled the sales of the restaurant's kids' club meals and was truly a fast food phenomenon. In fact, its popularity actually became a bit of a problem, as within just one month into the six month campaign, the initial batch of 30 million toys were completely sold out. So until a new batch arrived, they had to resort to cheap trading cards that were originally meant for distribution at AMC theaters. But the success of The Lion King for BK went beyond just the initial campaign, as within a single year they had not just one, but two more campaigns. Oh yeah, so I don't know if you're back yet, but like if you're back, uh, just message me because I'd admit you uh, extra sounds just jumping through your mic. <laughs> which at the time was pretty unheard of. This was the primary reason behind the Disney-McDonald's partnership in 1997, as the mouse was pretty upset as to having missed out on all the fun, aka money, and was determined to not make the same mistake twice. Nevertheless, Burger King continued to thrive with other Disney tie-ins, such as Pocahontas, Toy Story, The Hunchback of Notre Dame, and many more throughout the 90s. And of course, who can forget those iconic signature Disney cops, which I'm willing to bet you or your parents still have in their house to this day. But it wasn't just the movies of Disney that became synonymous with the BK Kids Club. Just to name a few, there's Rugrats the Movie, The Land Before Time, Anastasia, and Small Soldiers. Yo, uh, Land Before kind of. Time. You see, Small Soldiers was supposed to be part of the Kids Club, but when the film wound up receiving a hard PG-13 rating, they had to switch gears fast. So they simply became optional toys and were disassociated from the Kids Club itself. 
But as a quick fun fact, this led to the BK Big Kids Club, which allowed them to more freely promote other PG-13 films, such as the beloved action comedy Wild Wild West the following year. Introducing the tasty new Burger King Big Kids meal. Now your kids can get more of the great tasting food they like, plus all the action and adventure of the new Wild Wild West movie. Now I could go on and on about all the other amazing movie tie-ins, such as those awesome Jurassic Park watches, the Pokemon 23 karat gold cards, and my personal favorite, The Lord of the Rings The Fellowship of the Ring. But to avoid making this a Burger King toy nostalgia list video, I'm gonna force myself to move on. You see, upon entering the 2000s, a new member was added to the BK Kids Club, Jazz, an Asian girl who loved music. However, by this point, the actual kids of the kids' club were rarely, if ever, used in the restaurant's advertising, so her presence and how much she was actually used has become a bit of a mystery. Regardless, by 2005, the kids' club gang was officially retired, and in their place were the very short-lived Honbats. There was Mix Max, This or That, Bonnie, Chomp, and the Eeps. But this was also around the time when major fast food chains were undergoing a lot of scrutiny, especially for how they were advertising to children. And for that, you can mainly thank McDonald's. So by and large, the Honbats signaled the end of an era, at least when it came to the younger demographic, because then came the return of the king in the most bizarre way imaginable. Yes, your time has finally come, Creepy King. Here we go. As the story goes, Who a new the advertising idea? firm joined Burger King and were toying with the idea of resurrecting the original mascot. Specifically, they wanted to find a way to make their new line of breakfast menu items really stick out from the competition, aka McDonald's. So one day an executive for the ad firm was searching through eBay and stumbled upon a 1970s Burger King King head for sale. The head, as it turns out, actually came from a helium tank overlay that was used to blow up balloons. Throw in the tagline of Yeah, you uh I'm just gonna you keep missed my shit. you missed my comment earlier, I guess. Uh no, I had to mute you. You had like extra like weird sounds just coming through the mic like nonstop. Oh, it was probably echo from the um from the the thing. Yeah. And I was yelling at stuff at you from across the room. <laughs> right. Well, it was just all incoherent just like noise. I'm like, "Well, uh, oh, I no. didn't realize." <laughs> I think it must have been um, uh, just Echo. Yeah. Uh, in any event. Wake up with the king, and someone's brilliant, albeit warped, sense of humor came up with one of the most bizarre fast food campaigns of all time. <laughs> Goals. New, the double crew sandwich. The debut of the so-called Creepy King was just what Burger King needed to stand out. <laughs> okay, okay. These are great. You can, you can keep calling it creepy, but like, these are fire. <laughs> these are great. These are great. These are fucking hilarious. These are so good. <laughs> A lot of people are like, what the fuck? <laughs> Out like amongst the competition, like, the and for nearly a decade. Oh my god. Oh my god. <laughs> Make that a fucking Five Nights at Freddy style game. Holy <laughs> shit. Being hunted down by the game. That's terrifying. That's amazing. I fall. I, if I'm working on a giant thing of like construction scaffolding, I fall. I turn around, I see that looking at me. I'm falling down. I'm sorry. Like, <laughs> <laughs> that is fire. That's so good. Okay, Why do his was eyes quite look the like pistols are facing you? <laughs> it looks like a phenomenon. It was gun. also a total 180 when it came to marketing. I mean, can you imagine Ronald McDonald literally stalking people in their houses and handing them Big Macs? I don't think so. I kind of remember that. King commercial. also occasionally appeared alongside. Wait, I want to hear what this guy's saying about it. I want to hear what his opinion is on this shit. I think he's shit talking it. New God, double so crew sandwich. The debut of the so-called Creepy King was just what Burger King needed to stand out amongst the competition, and for nearly a decade was quite the pop culture phenomenon. It was also a total 180 when it came to marketing. I mean, can you imagine Ronald McDonald literally stalking people in their houses and handing them Big Macs? I don't think so. 
The Creepy okay, King okay, also occasionally appeared alongside iconic characters in movie tie-ins, and in one of the most awkward integrations <laughs> of all time, promoted the SpongeBob SquarePants Kids Club meal. I like square butts and I cannot lie. Squid and sea star can't deny. <laughs> I think I'm gonna go buy a Okay, Walker. what the absolute f I There were I'm even Xbox 360 video Walker. games oh produced starring. <laughs> That's fucking awesome. <laughs> that is so out of pocket. It's awesome. That's so good. <laughs> That's, I that... want to buy a Whopper now. Uh, I, uh, I thought, I thought about getting, like, starting this whole thing with, like, showing up and just, like, having, like, a whole Burger King's meal. And then I just, like, got lazy, basically. It's just, like, tired. Now you regret it. Now you want one. Y now, yeah, now I, now I want a, I'm now convinced. I want Whopper. Like, listen, those, like, 2000s commercials, like, that hits it. Like, right there. Shit, like, I, I take back my entire philosophy. If I know, I, I know I always say that games are no longer made by people who know how to make games. They're made by people who know how to market. But clearly, these people don't know how to market either. Because if these motherfuckers, they they pumped out some games too, and they're all fire. Look at them. <laughs> yeah, I remember these clearly coming out and marketing, like also be able to make good games. These CEOs are just bad at everything. I figured it out. I mean, <laughs> they're not good at marketing. So this is what it looks like when you're good at marketing. Yeah. Yeah, no, seriously. Burger King marketing, 10 out of 10. <laughs> who was it? Who was it that did all this? I'm going to look up who their marketing like guy was. What what year is this? What uh, era? What year should I be Googling? Well, they got one for uh, Revenge of the Sith. So see when Star Wars 3 came out. Yeah, I want to say this was head. like 2006, 7, 8, 9 ish. Marketing director, 2000, we'll call it so. Yeah, well, hold on, let's see when um, Star Wars 3 release date. Uh, 2005, so yeah, uh, maybe look at like 2006, we'll say. I can only find the current marketing leak head. Uh they mentioned I can't the guy. The, previous one. the guy mentioned that like a new they picked up a new marketing firm, so it was like a whole firm like came in. It was like, yo, let's just make like the king stalking people, and I guess mm -hmm. they were like went with it. They probably, if I had to guess, they had to make at least one video and sh and actually show it, and just everyone in the boardroom was like, that's funny, like that's right where the sense of humor is in the mid two thousands right um mm -hmm. yeah because this is this is literally the humor that i grew up with so like i yeah this like hits me like great. right right in that button right <laughs> Shit. i just fucking kicked my controller Died. off the table that's uh impressive the creepy burger king icon one of which and i swear <laughs> i'm not making this up had you play as the burger king himself sneaking around and stalking game. unsuspecting pedestrians and offering awesome. them whoppers However, if six or Google seven years in, it seems the shock value and appeal of the so character like, began to wear thin, as the Burger King's creepy ruler was like retired in 2011. Although in recent years, the king has made quite a few appearances, and as of 2020, seems to have come out of retirement, oh. at least temporarily. So unlike most episodes, there's really no end to this story. <laughs> what? So if you were banking on a hard-hitting and epic conclusion, I'm sorry to disappoint you. However, speaking of banking, are you disappointed with all the hassles and frustrations of traditional banks? Well, that's where Current comes in. See what I did there? You see, Current is. isn't a bank. I'm going to let it go. mobile banking for quite a few yeah. reasons. All right, so here's my general, here's my, uh, let me put it back a little bit. My general policy, if I'm going to react to like other people's yeah, videos. watching their content, you watch their ad. Watch their I'm ad. Watch I'm their ad. ad. Do the thing, okay? Like, <sighs> listen, everyone else watching right now, you like the, this video or this guy's breakdown, go like his video. Epic Whatever this inclusion. advertisement's for, I'm directly not going to get it, and instead I'm going to go buy a Whopper. <laughs> this guy did a better... I, I mean, I have more commentary on the, the actual video itself, but I'll let his ad run. run sorry to disappoint like right you. Down the street However, speaking of so bank, 
Oh, there's like I'm a bunch so near me. There's so many. I, like, I go get so one right now while you're watching the video. Come back and we do a live Whopper review. Yeah. <laughs> After the video. Man, do uh, I want to like not just not, not have worth. whatever my like family is having for dinner and like and, like on my meal break instead I go out and like get a burk. Maybe I will do that. Maybe I'll just go do that. But that's not for another like two hours. Banking. Are you disappointed with all the hassles and frustrations of traditional banks? Well, that's where Current no. comes in. See what I did there? You see, Current isn't a bank, but the future of mobile banking for quite a few reasons. For one, you could say goodbye to all those pesky overdraft fees for up to $100. You can also get paid up to two days faster than most banks when using direct deposit. Oh, and don't worry about a minimum balance to keep your account open. Plus, you'll have access to over 40,000 fee-free Allpoint ATMs. Current can even be- Yo. The whole getting paid two days earlier or like signing up for a Patreon to get videos a few days earlier Am I the only one who sees those as completely and utterly pointless? You're still waiting the same amount of time, paycheck to paycheck. The dates just move back a couple of days. So how is it an incentive that you get your paycheck two days earlier? It's like, yeah, maybe one one paycheck and then, then it's just on a normal clock. Like, are people just stupid, or am I misinterpreting how this is beneficial? There to you can at all? be some utility depending on your specific circumstance. For example, like if, you, if you need the money right now and it, it really helps to get it that two days earlier for that one paycheck, I guess. Nah, nah. I, I see. That. I see like a potential for a long term. So let's say, for example, you would normally get paid on let's say Saturday, right? But you want yeah. your money for a Friday for like Friday night partying right or something like that oh true true it's like like if it's just shifting your entire pay schedule two days earlier like gives you more access to your money for like say weekends or um some other like regular events that you put money into um is like one utility thing again that's super circumstantial but like eh, whatever um yeah, you know, like, I, I see stuff i don't know your life so all like, the time yeah. And it's like, why would I pay money to get something a little bit earlier every time? It's like I can pay money to get a video game a week earlier on like pre-release or something like that. That's worth it because I'm just paying the one time and then I'm getting it. It's not like a monthly thing that I'm just setting the date to a different time, but it's actually the same amount of length every time. But they mm -hmm. advertise it as if it's less length when it's not. I don't know. It pisses me off a little bit. You can continue it. Yeah. Used as a money transfer service between friends and family, or anyone else who has current. The debit card Another is fire, plus though. is just how quick and easy it is to sign up. Less than two minutes, in fact, which is less time than the upcoming credits. So you could literally sign up and support the channel before this episode ends. So join the future of mobile banking by going to current.com slash yesterworld or by checking out the link in the description below. Okay. Videos are uh, done. Here's oh, my thoughts the on the video. video. Yeah, it's not just credits. Oh, I thought that was like an ad midway through. Nah. Um. Oh, I have YouTube Premium. We ain't watching ads. <laughs> the only ads we're watching are content creator ads. Mhm. Mm um. Okay. So, why is this video called the downfall of the Burger King kingdom? Is he only referring to the kingdom thing? Where it's hard? I thought it was. Re I thought that was in reference to like the Burger King's like yeah stranglehold on. But now it seems more like he's talking about all the other characters that used marketing. to exist within their kingdom. Right, know? but we just mentioned and the king's coming the back. So like the main guy we care about. <laughs> but where's the downfall part? When did that happen? Yeah, I don't. Uh, I don't no. know. I remember oh, as a did kid you even uh, mention that their sales are doing bad now or something. No, but that actually was one of the um, initiatives as to why I got into this because there is, there is discussion of there being like a fast food depression right now, where like while the sales are like doing decent, the like overall feeling of like the quality. Um, yeah. of fast food in general is kind of down right now. Like everyone just and the, the feels like the price of fast food's gone up too significantly. Yeah, like more like, than it's, it's inflation really or anything. Like right, it, like it used to be cheaper to get fast food, 
than it would be to go to a grocery store and get ingredient and just buy like a some anything from there to eat you know right. it used and, to be cheaper and it was hot food and nowadays there are three fast food places you can go to and get food for five dollars or less that is mcdonald's with the the two for the two uh mcchickens or two mcdoubles for 3.99 uh that is taco bell because they always have like a five dollar meal box an eight dollar meal box and a ten dollar meal box mm -hmm. um and shit, what's the third one? I know there's a third one, but I forget exactly which it is. I'm not sure. But it's mostly but, just those two, if I'm being honest. But yeah, there's a general like sense of like quality's gone down while prices have gone up more than expected. Like more than you would expect for like say inflation or other like big economic drivers that you would expect to drive up like the the absolute price, you know. Um. <clears throat> Yeah. so like yeah uh okay so like thus far i haven't seen anything like actually that slimy <laughs> from burger fire king ass commercials that's what i saw yeah that's right. all i took from that video is that yeah. they used to have some of Bur the most banger fucking commercials right burger day. king's really got okay so we got another one here the untold truth of burger king from magnates media it's got 1.4 million views so like maybe there's and something why does it interesting look like there. it's a video about a massaging thing that's yeah, probably the advertisement but all right, oh. so let's let's see let's see if this guy's got anything spicy about Burger King. If there is nothing spicy here, I'm gonna say you know what, Burger King, just a burger place, just a, a cheap burger place. That's all it is. There's nothing with really spicy good marketing. Here. Yeah. If there's nothing spicy here, then I Cyborg Stare commit to purchasing one Whopper within the next <laughs> 24 hours. <laughs> P Pixar didn't happen. Oh, put it, put You'll, it in writing. You, yeah, you get a, it. you get a, you you get the paper with the sharpie and write the date and time, and you hold it yeah. next to the Burger King meal and you send it to the Discord. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if I could sign the Google Sheets for it. <laughs> okay, but but no, actually, like seriously, if uh, if this if this thirty minute video, this third thirty minute vi video that is promising spiciness, right? Doesn't have anything we didn't already know about Burger King, which was nothing that mind bending. I am I am yeah, I'm just going to like say Burger King is just like a cheap drive through burger place. There's nothing like crazy not about Burger cheap, King. Though. Burger King is not on that list of places you can get a meal for under ten dollars. It's, like it's still cheap to compared to normal burger places, like no. burger, like not. I'm not talking fast food. No. I'm saying like burger places, like burger joints. I mean, I guess, but it's I definitely on the high end when it comes to fast food burger prices. Yeah, for it's fast food, but the point of fast food is being cheaper than well before it was like cheaper than any food, but it's also cheaper than like full on restaurants. Like if I go, if I were to go to oh, uh, well actually. Well, the thing is, well, I guess I Five Guys is on like the upper end of. Yeah, if I go to Habit Burger, if I go to Habit Burger, which is probably not near you at all. Yeah, I was about to say, what is kind of Habit Burger? Like, Habit what? Burger, like, I can get a fucking char burger with cheese for five bucks, and it's 10 million times better than their burger. I can go to In N Out and I can get any plethora of burgers. I could probably get two burgers for under $8 there. Uh, okay. I could go to fucking Fat Burger and get a burger from there. Okay, but if I were to go burger, to a, a burger from there for five dollars, sit those down. All, most of those places are sit downs. Okay, all right. Maybe it's just up here because it's like if I go yeah, to if I go if I go to Five Guys, which is pretty good burgers. That's gonna yeah, be like five guys thirteen dollars. expensive. Yeah, but if I go to like Applebee's, which shockingly, like I don't, I think the burgers are actually pretty decent. Like I actually like their bourbon burger a fair mm -hmm. bit. Um. Or uh, oh, what's the other the other place I really liked recently? Was that um, was that Red Robin? Maybe. Yo. Um, those are still like fifteen dollar burgers. <laughs> they're really True. good, but they're like fifteen dollar burgers. Um, yeah. And you, yeah, you get a side with that, but still, it's like you're <laughs> by the time you leave from a whole bro. meal, by the time you leave from from a whole meal, you've spent like thirty dollars, right? It's it's pretty much the same shit at Burger King, bro. I like, can't you imagine meal, you can, it, it's going to be 20 bucks. Listen, I'm going to maybe even more. You know what? I'm going to do it. 
when I go on meal break, I'm going to I'm going to Burger King. <laughs> meal, I'll yeah, come I back and have that stuff. Two whoppers, a large fry, and a soda, and paid twenty eight dollars. Okay, all right. I'm gonna see what the prices are like around that's, here. Like, Hold on. Where's up. where's <laughs> the closest Burger King to here? Is that on is that on Route Two? Burger King. You should Google this on stream and dox yourself. Yeah, right. Hold on. Let me get. Let me drive to your house so I can sniper wolf you real quick. Oh, there's one on the main road I live on. Okay, cool. Where where is that? Uh, I guess I could go check your. Oh, it's way down there. Stuff. Oh, okay. I know where that's. Oh, all right. Yeah, no, it's it's D and D, not One Piece shit. Right, it's where the you know what's weird? Okay, when I was a kid, right, there was a there's a the there's a Walmart and a and like next to it was a McDonald's, if I'm remembering this and correctly. In? A Walmart and then next to it was like a McDonald's, which is like fairly like ah. but this is like in the middle of like like you're driving down a road just surrounded by forest and then like suddenly there's like this. <laughs> Like Walmart. it's not not like a ton of <laughs> it's not like a ton of force, but like you'd be driving to be like it, houses, businesses, houses with like some trees between it. Cause like it's pretty green here, right? Um, but then like suddenly it's like a solid minute of like the woods, and then suddenly like Walmart and McDonald's, right? And then like at some point, I and then there was a no little like um some other little like department store uh, like behind the McDonald's, and then um. And I don't know when, but like at some point, the McDonald's like left that building, became a Burger King, and then you know what? McDonald's like picked up a new place just directly across the street. Dude. And now you have like directly across the street from each other a Burger King and a McDonald's, yeah. and then uh, oh, you don't know what this place is, but like the Walmart like actually left there and became and it became a job lot, mm. um, which is just Dude, like Walmart. A Walmart light. that I, I used to uh, a Walmart that I worked security for for like a very short period of time. Yeah, not a Walmart. I'm thinking of Home Depot. Yeah, a Home Depot. I worked security for for Home a short Depot period of time. Home Depot has security trouble. What? Huh? I. I I guess it like makes. Did you like only like watch cameras or stuff? Because I feel like I feel like I've never no, seen I was a an one foot security guard who oh. dealt with people. Face I feel like face. I've never seen one of those in a Home Depot here. Weird, huh? Anyway, uh, we'll go that's on. That's because I lived in the worst area. Just hor everywhere needed security. Oh uh, yeah, right. You live in a uh, GTA we a server. Guy that I used to refer to. I caught a guy there. Who I used to refer to a super villain because he stole over two million dollars worth of merchandise over the course of like 15 years just going what? in getting a bunch of stuff for his job site putting it on a cart and then just not scanning one like three thousand dollar tool and walking out with it and he did oh. that daily for 15 years that's a thousand dollars a thousand dollars like an eight hundred dollar tool a five hundred dollar tool you know we, we caught his ass and i used to refer to him as super villain huh but the story I was going to tell you about is that Home Depot got in trouble because they got caught. Uh, they were fucking cutting down trees in just like the public forest out back and then <laughs> selling them as lumber. Huh. Okay. <laughs> so one of the managers or whatever was like going out there on his own time and then like selling it and pocketing the money. And they're like putting it on the lumber shelves. And shit. It was like, it was fucking crazy. It was well after I stopped working there. I heard about it. The whole place got fucking like shut down, and now there's a big five there. That's big wild. Five sporting goods. But huh. yeah, all right. The so we're very happy about them losing over a million dollars worth of merchandise to begin with, <laughs> and then that was yeah. probably the last straw. <laughs> so like, yeah, I'm gonna do when it when it's time for me to go on like dinner break. I'm a I'm a properly test out like hey, how much is this cuz it's like normally like if I'm out and about and I'm going to do like fast food for some reason, my go-to is Wendy's. I've not been to Burger King in like 12 years. <laughs> but I haven't been to Burger King in years as well. Um but yeah, let's find huh. out has their quality like dropped dramatically? Have their prices increased dramatically? You know, let's let's like actually see it for ourselves. <laughs> Are you going right now to go do that? No, no, when it's time for my dinner break around 6 -ish. Oh, okay, I was going to say, if you're going right now to go do that, I might say fuck it and just also go get a burger and we'll come back. <laughs> we'll do a tandem review. No, no, in like, uh, in like an hour and a half. It. Actually, you know what? Uh, by the time we finish this video, because I imagine I'm probably going to keep pausing and talking uh, about by, stuff by and stuff. By that time, so I'm like, going to yeah. have to peel apart to go do some, get ready for my, my work game.
It's at, the game itself is at like the call time for it is about 345 currently about 130 right now so i still got a mm -hmm. while a couple hours fair enough i probably want to um, peel off 30 minutes before that to get all my notes straight yeah okay so I'm this is magnates media which man never heard of them but they're like 1.23 million subs so like that's a thing um it's not that much anymore <laughs> It's <laughs> million is still like a it's still a fuck up. It's still like a pretty big checkpoint though, let's be real. Um for a channel subscriber count, yeah. And then like actually ha um having 1.4 million views on an eight month old video. I'm getting a, a knock on my door. I'm gonna be right back. I'll mute up myself so there's no background noise. I think what you heard before it was like me opening and closing doors and then like opening my fan area and coughing outside while I was smoking. That's probably all the weird noise you heard. Uh, I'll mute myself up though. I'll be right back. Okay. All right. So yeah, that's uh is there is there anything actually spicy going on with Burger King or is this just like a nothing a nothing burger? Haha. -ha. We we did it, guys. We did it. Mission accomplished. 1957, when McDonald's was doubling the number of restaurants it opened. Hold on, wait, what? I just, I feel like I just like completely missed. What is it saying? In 1957, when McDonald's was doubling the number of restaurants it opened every year, a little-known Florida startup called Insta Burger was on the brink of bankruptcy and fighting to keep its doors open. However, this failing business would later become the global fast food empire Burger King, making tens of billions of dollars a year and operating in over a hundred countries around the world. The truth of how they achieved this is crazy, and involves smashing up their own equipment with an axe. What? But whilst Burger King is undeniably an inspiring underdog entrepreneurial success story, there's also a dark twist. Because the secret to Burger King's success was stolen. Oh. Do we get now? Do we get some spiciness? The year was 1952, and the wildly popular car hop craze sweeping across America was reaching its pinnacle. All over the country, people were skipping the traditional home-cooked meal to dine out on cheap hamburgers, greasy fries, and thick shakes delivered to their cars by costumed waitresses in paper hats. Pioneering the fast food movement was McDonald's, a fast food business started by two brothers who'd managed to build a hugely popular restaurant thanks to their unique assembly line style kitchen, which they called their speedy service system. This allowed them to produce large quantities of food very quickly, and as crowds of people lined up to buy their hamburgers, it was clearly a success. However, one day a man named Keith Kramer and his stepfather Matthew Burns paid a visit to McDonald's. They'd been hearing about its popularity and that this hamburger stand was making a profit of $100,000 a year, well over a million dollars in today's market, and so they wanted to check it out for themselves. When Keith and Matthew got to McDonald's, it lived up to the hype. They were so impressed with McDonald's streamlined operation that they began researching how they could achieve something similar similar themselves, as clearly there was a business opportunity to bring this kind of fast food model to other parts of the country. Because at this point, the McDonald's brothers just had one single store. However, Keith and Matthew needed a way to figure out how to mass produce food so quickly. And during their research, they stumbled across two pieces of culinary equipment called Miracle Insta Machines. The first of these was the Insta Shake Machine, which churned out four flavors of milkshakes at a rate of roughly six per minute. And the wow. second machine was the Insta Broiler Oven, which can consisted of an automated conveyor system that employed electric heating elements to cook a continuous stream of beef patties while simultaneously toasting an equal number of hamburger buns. After passing through the oven, the toasted buns dropped into a basket while the burgers slid down a chute into a heated vat filled with ketchup, mustard, relish, and special seasonings. The journey from raw beef to sore-strenched hamburger took just over 90 seconds, meaning the Insta Broiler oven could crank out about 400 burgers an hour. For Keith and Matthew, who were concerned more about volume and efficiency than producing a quality product, this was the perfect answer to McDonald's speedy service system. They made a deal with the inventor of these Insta machines, where Keith and Matthew would have the rights to use them in a new restaurant they were creating in Florida, which they named Insta Burger. This was the predecessor to what later became Burger King, but initially they used the name Insta Burger instead, as the Insta was a direct reference to the Insta machines that produced the burgers so quickly. So although Burger King today might not like to admit this, there's no doubt that Burger King was heavily inspired by McDonald's. 
McDonald's. The whole business was started because Keith and Matthew wanted to try and replicate McDonald's's fast food burger business. Unfortunately for Keith and Matthew, the Insta Broiler oven they'd bought to mass produce burgers quickly was nowhere near as good as the intricate system McDonald's had created. In fact, they soon realized the Insta Broiler oven broke down almost every few days. It was extremely Oof. temperamental, and the quality of burgers it produced wasn't exactly that great either. Ironically though, if the equipment they bought hadn't been faulty, it's quite likely Burger King as we know it today wouldn't exist. But we'll get to that. First though, something strange happened. Okay. So we've already gotten a few, uh, we've already gotten a few bits and pieces of information we didn't get before, so that's cool. It does seem like this guy goes a bit deeper. While construction of the first Instaburger restaurant was underway in Jacksonville in 1953, Keith and Matthew inadvertently found their first franchisee. David Edgerton was actually in the process of becoming a Dairy Queen franchisee when he stumbled across the half-built Instaburger restaurant that was still in progress. David mistakenly thought the unfinished building was going to become a Dairy Queen, and so he stopped in to chat with Keith and Matthew, thinking that just like him, they were about to become owners of their own Dairy Queen. Of course, Keith and Matthew explained that actually, they were building a totally new restaurant chain called Instaburger. But sensing an opportunity here, the Instaburger founders began selling David on their burger concepts. They showed him a demonstration of their miracle Insta machines they'd bought that could produce burgers so quickly. And thankfully, this was a day where the machine worked perfectly. I when was David just saw this, that. he was amazed. He left Jacksonville believing he had glimpsed the future of dining out, and he wanted to be a part of it. Shortly after, David backed out of his deal with Dairy Queen and contracted with Keith and Matthew to open an Insta Burger store of his own, which would be based in Miami. So before the first ever Insta Burger restaurant had even opened, they had a franchisee ready to open a second store. But before nice. agreeing the deal, David made a key suggestion, change the company's name to Insta Burger King. David even sketched a logo depicting a cartoon king sitting atop a hamburger with an arm wrapped around a giant shake. Okay. He left the doodle with Keith and Matthew and suggested they use it for a trademark. And Keith and Matthew immediately liked it. The word king gave the brand a more premium feel, and having a character to associate with the brand made it much more unique than just Insta Burger. So when the first store opened its doors in Jacksonville in April 1953, the restaurant featured a sign that extended 12 feet above the roof with the logo and name David had suggested. Insta Burger King was officially up and running, and for all intents and purposes, the future looked bright. In fact, one year after opening the Jacksonville store, Keith and Matthew began advertising for more franchisees by circulating flyers that claimed Insta Burger King was the greatest advancement in food service in the last No son, you do not get Burger King. Sorry, Zafiana. <laughs> we might finally get some spice on Burger King. I'm on my third video and there hasn't been a whole lot except really good marketing. <laughs> 50 years. The pitch even suggested that a $20,000 investment in a franchise like theirs could pay for itself in just one year. And if you'd seen one of these flyers at the time, you might have believed this really was a great investment opportunity to open one of your own Insta Burger King restaurants. Unfortunately, if you had believed that, you'd have been wrong, and you'd have probably lost a lot of money. Oh. Getting spicy. Maybe. <clears throat> Problems. Oh. Insta Burger King's we'll service system was undeniably confusing for customers. You would order from your car at one window, but then had to pay up front before getting the food, which was very uncommon at the time. You were then given a numbered ticket for each item purchased, and then you would take that to a second separate window and collect your items. But you often had to then repeat your whole order again. The system was quite frustrating for customers, who were accustomed to having the food delivered to their cars and pay for it after it was delivered. However, the two Instaburger founders and their first franchisee David all believed that customers just needed time to adapt to the new system. Although definitely the system system itself wasn't very efficiently designed to begin with. But still, the much bigger problem was that their Insta Broiler machine to quickly make the burgers was agonizingly unreliable, often breaking down in the middle of the day. And of course, the whole selling point of the Insta Burger King stores was fast and cheap food. But if they're- Wait, wait, wait. Also, so just like McDonald's uh, ice cream machine, right? True. Mmm, which I do know there's a whole conspiracy about that thing. We can get to that later. <clears throat> I 
I think they just have a contract with a shitty machine. I'm, I keep getting tagged in this other server by this guy, like, going nuts, insisting that because <clears throat> the U.S. interest payment on federal debt versus defense spending, they just flipped this year. And that means that the U.S. is going to be completely destroyed and that, like, it's going to become 50... The interest payments are going to surpass 50% of tax revenue by 2025. And I'm like, dude... Tell him you're going to flip him into a bad acid if he doesn't shut the fuck up. <laughs> I'm like... You know what the you know what the percentage of the 2022 federal spending was on the interest payments? Eight percent. You telling me it's gonna go from eight to fifty percent in three years? Shut up. <laughs> he thinks that we're gonna become Argentina, Argentina right now in like three years. Like, what are you what are you on about? Not even close. Anyway. Actually, I just played a Civ game last night. That's kind of how it went. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, I fucked up, but I mean, yeah, no, it sounds like you're bad at fiscal policy. Then it's not that hard. I don't know. I just started going to war with everyone. It's not my fault. Well, okay. Well, that's probably your problem. <laughs> Ovens kept breaking down and needed to be repaired. The food wasn't that fast, and it wasn't even that cheap, really. Their burgers were 18 cents, whereas their competitors sold similar burgers for 15 cents. So the founders, Keith and Matthew, were not gaining the traction Crazy. they'd hoped for with their first Insta Burger King restaurant in Jacksonville. Meanwhile, David Edgerton, Insta Burger's first franchisee, opened his store in Miami on March 1st, 1954. But just like the co-founders, it was a difficult start for him too because of the unreliable burger-making equipment. However, David still strongly believed that their fast food dining experience was the future. But David also knew that making his fortune in fast food would require a significant number of stores. He was never going to get rich just having one franchise location. So he agreed with Keith and Matthew he could handle all of the Miami area and open more Insta Burger locations there. Now you might be thinking, how could David afford to be opening more stores? Dude, it's so hard to paint cheese. Like capital cheese is a nightmare to get even close to it. Because that curve, uh, that initial big curve, just immediately just becomes a giant spot because of how uh, how bristles move at that size. Ah, it took me until that sentence to realize you were talking about painting. <laughs> I said painting G's. Like, that's how I opened. All right, anyway. Some people just don't listen to me. Zofiano listens to me. Was <laughs> if his first yeah, one had only just opened. What? Do you think I come in here to listen to you? Yes. Yeah, damn Skippy. All right, play the video. <laughs> and I wasn't even going that well. And you're right. He couldn't afford it. David had invested all the money he had into this first small Miami store, which wasn't doing particularly great sales numbers yet. So with no more capital of his own to invest, he needed to bring in a partner. David began contacting several well-known restaurateurs, all of which decided to pass, which wasn't too surprising Why given David's first store was sexy. hardly a big success. However, one of the restaurateurs he spoke with did recognize- Wait, didn't you know people oh, no, in the late- <laughs> Sophia is too busy at work. Ooh. Uh, no, didn't she know that like just everyone in the 50s was super sexy? <laughs> it just looked better back Every then. Every single person he's using as like a person to represent who he's talking about is just like, fuck, fuck, smash, smash, yeah. <laughs> smash. God damn it. <laughs> Can at least one of them be ugly? Nope. I recommend David speak to a man who owned a small local restaurant called the Brickle Bro. No, it is that people that Brickle own Rich. people that own fast food don't eat fast food, so they're healthier, so they look better. Didn't you know that? You say that, but Donald Trump ate at McDonald's weekly. Did, I don't know if the Donald Trump counts in this list. <laughs> I'm sure he, he somehow makes it. If I if I looked hard enough, I could probably find some line. Donald Trump was actually one of the first investors in Burger King. No, <laughs> could you imagine? <laughs> I 
I'm just going to tell this other guy, by the way, laughs in GDP growth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Who listen, hey, old... do you realize how much, like, how big the U.S. economy is and is growing consistently? We're fine. Uh, our, our answer to all our problems is... Actually, actually, this, is, this has been my personal philosophy for the last, like, you know, six to eight months, and it's worked out great. Always make more money. A M M M. Always make more money. Can I afford this? I don't know. I'll go make more money. This, you know, do I want this? Let's make more money. Like that. That's it. <laughs> that easy. Oh my god. I'm just reading through. I wrote like 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 flash notes when we were playing our last session. I'm just gonna read them through in chronological order. Oh Drende boy. intro with music. Liza wants to go to trade school at Rannoch. Gungren has befriended 26 homeless people of Tromouth, now members of the Cool Guy Alliance. It will cost five silver per day per, uh, uh, per person in rations to travel. Fitzgerald is an orc construct that is hiding. They are a construct. Uh, Robert Finson, house key first list sacrifice. Uh, Bo was run over by a two horse cart, so the party has set up a GoFundMe to get him fixed. Finson family treasure. What? <laughs> <laughs> yeah right what Drende is a character they were doing a circus thing and they were performing so I wrote down that they're in soundly the said Dende their music. you got yeah, a little, little, little green in your game Liza is an NPC who wants to who is stuck with one of the party members and she wants to go to Rannoch the capital to attend a trade school Gungren is an NP is a player who befriended 26 homeless people of Trome out there now the cool guy alliance I think that kind of speaks for itself uh, and then I was just writing down some stats for traveling Fitzgerald is an NPC who is an orc construct that is hiding that they are a construct. I don't even remember what I wrote that down for. I have no fucking clue. I couldn't tell you anything about that. I'm hoping when you get into the game, I'll just be reminded. Uh, Robert Finson, Hounds key, House Key. So Robert Finson is a random dude. Uh, he was the one driving the two horse cart that ran over Bo, which is one of the players. Uh, is the the ranger's animal companion, Bear, like a baby bear, like like the cub. It's like a smaller bear because it can't have full bear stats for balance. Uh, Robert Finson was the guy driving it. List is a player who's a warlock who had to sacrifice him, and then he took his house key. And when they went into Robert Finson's house, they found a map to the Finson family treasure. <laughs> My notes. <laughs> okay. That's just like one quarter of a page. I have like 20 pages. <laughs> Listen, here's my response to that. I'm going to Brickle Bridge, okay? <laughs> Brickle Bridge? Bridge. You're going to go get yourself a Brickle Bridge And it's here that we meet the four... Th yeah, yeah. Best I'm burger in town. Hey, you want to go get a Brickle down the road? Yeah, Beast yeah. Or Beast Burger? Let's go get Brickled. <laughs> you guys ready to go get bricked? <laughs> Oh, dude, you're like sitting in Brickle Burger, like Brickle, whatever the hell, like lean back, stomach extended out, like, oh, I'm so bricked. Jeez. <laughs> they bricked me so good. <laughs> like, did recommend David speak to a man who owned a small local restaurant called the Brickle Bridge. And it's here that we meet the fourth and final protagonist in our story, and arguably the most important person in Burger King's history, Brookie. James oh, McLemore. No. <laughs> oh, okay. We were both wrong. But also somehow the same amount of right. <laughs> James McLemore had a rough start in life, Those to say the, the least. Like he was born in 1926 to a reasonably wealthy family in New York City. <laughs> However, his father lost all the family's <laughs> wealth in the infamous stock market crash Damn. of 1929. <laughs> James's beloved grandfather died shortly after, with many believing the family's <laughs> sudden dark financial turn caused his health to deteriorate. Meanwhile, James's mother was then committed to a psychiatric hospital, or as it was then known, an insane asylum. James never saw his mother again as children weren't allowed to visit. Honestly though, maybe that was for the best, as this was in the early 30s and those hospitals were like something out of a horror movie. Remember, back in the 1930s, one of the prevailing medical treatments for mental health conditions was a lobotomy, which was literally cutting connections in the brain. As for James, since his father lost his job due to the Great Depression, they'd moved to James's grandmother's farm in the countryside. But a fire ravaged the whole town, and his grandmother was forced to sell most of her possessions in order for the family to have enough money to survive. 
Despite the bleak outlook for James's future, through hard work, he would eventually manage to enroll in Cornell University. He arrived there with just $11 in his pocket, but graduated in 1947 after learning useful business and management skills. And after a series of jobs in the restaurant industry, James saved up enough money to start his own restaurant, like called The Brickle Bridge, which he set up in Miami, pocket. Florida. Whilst this restaurant was nothing particularly special, it had started to make a modest profit. However, it was at this point that James got introduced to a man named David. Uh, I think it's actually closer to like a hundred bucks in today's money. Who? Yeah, uh, the eleven bucks in his pocket thing. Thousand? No, like a hundred. A million. Okay. That other dude is still tagging me in like just complete like like. Here, let me log into your Discord and argue in your in your place. <laughs> I'll pretend I'm you. I think people would see through that like instantly. Also, that'd be concerning because I'm a mod in that server. <laughs> what's the what's the server? Am I on it? I might be on it just randomly. Uh the Plato's Republic one. It's in the econ finance channel. I think I invited you to that server. Yeah, because they were talking about maybe doing like a server D D game a while ago. That kind of just died on arrival. Also, I got a, I got pee. I'll be right back. Okay, I'm back. <laughs> don't, don't look at the econ chat. <laughs> oh, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> I added him. Who said you could dodge the beast? Come on. Yeah. I did genuinely block him too. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Fucker <laughs> <laughs> right. added me with the dictionary definition thumbs. <laughs> it's pretty good. So I'd say it was a pretty pretty baller move. All right. <laughs> All right. So I am moving on to the Land Raider, which we'll be doing. What was I working on last time? I think it was this Flamestorm can. Mm -hmm. Actual. Problems. I'm working on. I'm working on making a. Uh, map of a town real quick i've found that the genuinely my best bet at making town borders that look realistic is to just close my eyes and then randomly just like shake my mouse around in a shape that makes sense and that ends up creating the most interesting looking towns and islands and continents and everything for me i've tried actually making them and they always look like they're just too circular or way too square too or planned. they fit into the border too easily like it's like I ended up making this this island just a rectangular island because it fits into the rectangular map I'm making. It's like things are not proper. Right. That makes sense. This is way better. Yeah. Although I'm thinking of this town being kind of like a peanut shape. Is this definitely the piece? Anyways, video time. Oh, I got figure. Yeah, I guess I was it wasn't. Okay. Actually, oh wait, no. I wanna. I wanna paint the other oh, door sorry. for the for the main body here. Okay. Yeah, we're going to paint this door. It's a, it's a fancy door. Anyway. No. Oof. David Edgerton, the first franchisee of Insta Burger King. And David had come to pitch James on the idea of going into business with him to open more of these Insta Burger King stores. Now, David had only been running his first Insta Burger King store for three months at this point, but he explained that he had the rights to open more of these stores all across Miami, and he just needed a business partner to help him. And James was immediately drawn in by the idea of teaming up to open multiple fast food restaurants together. Not only did David and James both get on really well, and were both Cornell graduates, both men also agreed that running a single restaurant wasn't the future they wanted, but instead the more lucrative path was owning a chain of fast food restaurants, and partnering up would be the quickest way to achieve that. Plus, as part of his pitch to James, David estimated his first Insta Burger King restaurant was generating a profit of 28% of sales, a substantial number for such a small operation. So James almost agreed to come on board right there on the spot. He just asked to take a look at the books to see the profits for himself. Unfortunately, James then discovered that David's strength was neither in accounting nor organization. 
When James asked to see his financial statements, David gave James a peach basket stuffed with contracts, receipts, and outstanding bills. Yeah. Not only did this look incredibly <laughs> unprofessional That's and organized, That's after mean, James went like through all the peach scented financial like records himself, he discovered that David's belief the store was making a 28% profit was completely wrong. Insta Burger King was actually operating at a 56% loss. Oh. At this point, you'd think James would abandon the idea completely, go back to his modestly profitable Brickle Bridge restaurant, and forget all about Insta the Burger King, but he didn't. If he doesn't, James was much more point. excited by David's pitch of them teaming up to open a chain of Insta Burger King stores. And so against all odds, James and David still struck up a partnership. In his memoir, James explains that he based this financially questionable decision on the fact that although Insta Burger King technically was making a loss, this was mostly due to the large initial startup costs, and that if the store was run well, the model did make financial sense. Plus, more importantly, James liked David. The two were on the same page with everything and shared a similar vision. And what David lacked in accounting skills, he more than made up for with integrity and hard work. Two skills James valued extremely highly. So the two became business partners. James sold his Bricklebridge restaurant and invested every penny he had in Insta Burger King of Miami. His $20,000 contribution matched David's total investment to that point and made the men 50-50 partners in the business. Although remember, the business was currently making a loss. But it was actually this partnership James and David, that would shape the future success of Burger King, not the original founders back in Jacksonville. However, before they found that success, they first had a lot more failures to go through. You see, you may be tempted to think that these two newly minted partners would use James's infusion of capital to pay down the debt on their existing Miami outlet and address the myriad of issues plaguing their operation, like the poor quality burgers, or the Insta broiler ovens that kept breaking, or even the ordering system that customers were unhappy with. But none of that is what they used the money for. Instead, Instead, like. David and James got a bit overexcited about the concept of running multiple stores, and thus they leveraged their capital to open two new locations, serving the same mediocre product, intermittently prepared on the same faulty Insta equipment. James later admitted okay. that opening more locations before ironing out their laundry list of operational issues was a critical mistake that pushed the company to the brink of insolvency. The fact that he and David understood this makes their next move all the more confusing. Before we get to the next part of the story, of let's be honest here. As much as this like video might be making you crave on. some fa- Well, it wasn't even marketing moves, it was operational cringe. Yeah, yeah, it's just like, like they just did some like cringe operational moves early on, and that seems to be what this is focusing on the most. It's not talking about like, I mean, I, just, I mean, we're still early on, so like, yeah. there's still a lot of video, you could go into other shit, but I, I, I get mean, it. He mentioned something I mean, about something being some stolen. Some cringe shit that happened early on, if you look hard enough, I feel like. Oh, yes. Yes. No. Listen, unless unless it's like the, uh, you know, uh, being started by someone to start a bunch of businesses before that, every business is littered with like a bunch of like near death, effectively, um, near death moments of people just figuring stuff out. Yeah. Because you'd be shocked how um, unintuitive a lot of like good business senses actually or at least well okay it seems intuitive to people that like know it but i don't know it seems most people don't inherently grasp a know lot it. of the <laughs> concepts yeah yeah it's weird it, like to me it's weird but then i have to remember that i've done a bunch of stuff like this before so like yeah i've been there i've been into the trenches and like screwed up businesses and businesses fall apart and have to junk in move on i've stuff. been in these trenches before yeah first time um, yeah that's uh every time i get in i get in a conversation with somebody with fledgling business and having problems i'm like huh, first time <laughs> 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 but uh yeah so far it's not been necessarily i don't know you mentioned something about something being stolen earlier i was fuck i was trying to make a random town shape and i made a furby <laughs> That's hilarious. Continue the video before I devolve. Fast into food. Madness. Too much fast food is terrible for your skin, which is why I'm Shut pleased to introduce up. today's video sponsor, the Swedish beauty tech brand Foreo. 
Now, I'll admit, I don't know much about skincare, but what I do know is that I'm always interested in technology that can help improve my life. And Foreo has a wide range of innovative devices for home use to help make looking good easier than ever. For example, their Bear microcurrent device practically gives you a mini facelift from home. Bear is clinically proven to improve skin firmness and reduce wrinkles in just one week. In fact, 95% of users report after using this for a little while, their face looks younger and cheekbones look more lifted. So this seems like an ideal gift to buy for more. anyone who cares about skincare, or maybe even for yourself if you're looking for smoother and healthier skin. Just click the top link in the description below to check it out now. Wait, was that actually oh. a sponsor? Yeah, but also like, wait a second. Wait, that was actually a sponsor. I thought he was like talking about some Burger King thing he was joking about. <laughs> no. <I> was <laughs> no, it was actually sponsored, but also like, most users... I thought he was talking about how Burger King did some sponsor with a beauty company yeah, to claim that eating fast food made your skin look bad, and he was shit talking them for doing that. No, he's doing that. <laughs> but hold on, like the whole like most users say that after using it for a little while, what does that mean? <laughs> yeah, it sounded like a like a, a, a like a scummy marketing thing that they was like the things he's just been pointing out. Is he doing that on purpose, trying to make it sound like a scummy marketing thing? Because that's what it sounded like. I, 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 thought, uh, I didn't think it was real. I, I don't think it was know. Real first the last line. First time watching this guy. No idea. His <laughs> editing is like extremely good, though. I have to say. Like all these visuals are like top notch. Like this is like real production level stuff. Actual documentary movies. Forged in flames. To keep their floundering Forged operation from fire. running out of money, James managed to convince this Harvey Fruhoff, a wealthy friend of his father-in-law, to invest $65,000 in exchange for half of their business. Harvey, who moved from Miami after stepping away from his $200 million a year trailer manufacturing company, could easily afford to risk $65,000 on this new concept. What's baffling, though, is what David and James did with the investment money they got. Oh Instead of reducing their debts by paying okay, down their drugs, existing drugs, loans, drugs, the partners drugs. opened three more locations across South Florida. <laughs> By the end of 1956, Insta Burger King of Miami was drowning in debt and saddled with seven tragically that. unreliable Insta Broiler ovens that produced mu- Okay, I have to- I have to say something that I've learned in business, okay? Them oh, not paying no down the debt- process. Well, hold on, alright, so... <laughs> them deciding to not pay down the debt and opening up more locations, right? That decision. That's not necessarily a bad decision. In fact, if you have your um, revenue to debt uh, ratio particularly good, or not revenue, profit, because like your, your debt payments come out of profit. So your profit to, um, to debt ratio is good. That's actually the better idea because um, then you'll up your, your revenue which will up the absolute value of your profits. So any debt involved just got easier to pay off, but you have to do all the math correctly on that, right? Because that's how most business today is done. It's all done on debt, right? If you're using your own money for large scale investments like this, like real estate and, and businesses, like buying businesses or investing, like large scale investments in businesses, if you're doing that with your own money, you're being dumb. <laughs> OPM, other people's money, always OPM if it's ever available, right? Which is basically what like the actual franchise <laughs> owners are mostly doing, right? Um, Landlords or at life. least at this point. Well, yeah. I mean, and listen, that's the thing. If other people, if other people are willing to put their money in the line, use their money, not yours. But here's the thing: if you're doing it well, correctly, over here as a landlord mindset, if you're mathing out your stuff correctly, both you and your um, your debtor are going to make more money in the long term. You're making money up front and they're going to make the interest on the debt. But again, you got to math all that out. And most people math out stuff like that pretty poorly. I don't like math. And the, the math I dumped is... that hoe in high school. <laughs> I'm trying to make me get back with my exes. It's not healthy. You should Marginally try a skincare thing on your feelings. <laughs> 
<laughs> Luckily for David and James, their fortunes were about to change thanks to the most unlikely of events. You see, one day during the middle of a busy lunch shift, James and David heard the familiar clattering of the Insta Broilers conveyor belt grinding to a halt. This once again meant the machine had broken down and would be out of action whilst it was repaired, thus losing them customers and revenue. David had only just recently fixed the machine and he was fed up. He grew so angry with it, he grabbed a hatchet from his toolbox and literally smashed the machine. James was somewhat amused. <laughs> <laughs> given he hated the machine too Please. for all the problems it caused them, but he was also concerned that their operation would be down until a replacement oven could be built and shipped from California. David, however, it had no intention spot. of paying for another malfunctioning miracle machine, and instead vowed to build a better one. With help from a local mechanic, Based. the engineering-minded David kept his promise and began trying to customize it's one so of their insta-broiler machines to create something better that was more reliable. After three weeks of almost continuous trial and error, they finally made a breakthrough. David Wait, they developed that thing in three weeks? What? Giga Chad, like Galaxy Brain, three weeks to develop that thing? That's it. That's bonkers, actually. Like in actual real world terms, like two dudes just developing like something like that in three weeks. That's Let's that's make wild. burger conveyor belt three weeks later. Yeah, literally. Well, here's the thing. They didn't even, like, the conveyor... They already um, had, like, a different version of it, though. Like. Well, well, no, because the other thing broiled. What their new thing does, because we've seen, like, the condensed version of this before, it's a flame... Uh, flame. Well, yeah, I guess it's kind of like a broiler, but, like, it's open flames, right? It's not, like, in compartments, like the old one. Um, like, they even look completely different successfully created a new flame broiler instead that employed gas not electricity to cook the and it used a different fuel source like also like <laughs> this is a huge jump in like the technology right not not necessarily like jump in like a giant improvement but like jump as in like in an engineering sense of r and something they're just like they they redid almost everything involved in this except for like the conveyor belt thing which they changed how the conveyor belt system works because they went to a pure horizontal design which is not what the old one did, which is, I think, probably part of why it kept, uh, like, breaking down, because it had a bunch of verticality in it. It's like, verticality and conveyor belts are not always the best of friends. Um, something to do with gravity involved? Yeah. Anyway. Oh, shit, shit, I need to undo that, I need to undo that. That's a swastika, that's a swastika, not a town wall, that's a swastika. Can't, you gotta undo that, Bart. Alrighty. <laughs> I, like, zoomed out for half a second and was like, oh, God. <laughs> What? Yep, that's definitely a swastika. I'm making a town map right now. All right, I'm just gonna cut all making that Making a town out. map. I was doing the walls. <laughs> I zoomed out. It's just a fucking swastika. Okay. Do you know nope. what I'm saying though about this R and D thing? Like how like actually like crazy oh, yeah, I'm this fully is. Following. Yeah, yeah. That's like that's nuts. And like three weeks, they just built like a whole new thing. Effectively, that works burgers. Not only did this invention prove infinitely more reliable than the old machines had been, but by making the broiler run on gas, David inadvertently created the flame broiled flavor that would become Burger King's signature taste. Still to this day, the fact that their burgers are flame grilled is a key part of their marketing. So that impulsive decision to smash their old burger making machine with a hatchet had forced David to spend time okay. creating something better, and he'd succeeded. To be fair, their new flame broiled- It's not like smashing it with a hatchet was like a key part of the creative process. No, it was. it was. It was. It was. <laughs> Listen, it was uh, no, no. Necessity, necessity is the mother of invention. Okay, you should know this as like guess, when yeah. when you're poor and you're hungry and you're not sure how you're gonna both like say pay rent and uh, get food. You get real motivated and real creative. <laughs> <laughs> So him like smashing it meant that he had no other options except make something better or no, no, he had three options. Get the thing that enraged him to the point of destroying the first one, which is like literal insanity. Like that's actual insanity. Smashing it was insanity. That's completely reasonable. Buying a new one after smashing it, that would have been insanity, right? Literally. True. So then he had two options, so he had two realistic options. Walk away from this entire thing he's invested absolute stupid amounts of money in for the time, and uh, what, several years now, or make a new one. She made the new one, and in like, as far as I'm concerned, record time. Like, <laughs> like this guy is a Chad. Machine was he Not good at accounting, but a Chad. <laughs> <laughs> 
a big improvement sure that helped the company make more there. money since yeah yeah well i mean we gotta humanize them right so it's gotta have some flaws <laughs> Now they could reliably produce large quantities of burgers on a consistent basis without the machine breaking. However, it wasn't this alone that changed their fortunes. It was actually a controversial discovery that would catapult the company to success. Oh, controversial. Whopper. David and James's new machine to make the burgers was much more reliable. And with things going well, they went to pay a visit to Jacksonville to see the original Insta Burger King founders. Turns out, things were not going so well for Keith and Matthew. They were still puzzled why Insta Burger King was failing as a concept, and had wrongly come to the conclusion that their location was to blame for their poor sales numbers. The solution they came up with was to purchase a movable, prefabricated stainless steel building for their next restaurants. The idea was that if sales weren't sufficient wherever they set up shop, they'd simply pick up and move someplace else where they might fare better. This was the reason David and James had driven up to have a look, to see if this idea was something they should incorporate for the Insta Burger King in Miami that they ran, but after sitting outside the stainless steel store for two hours, the restaurant failed to attract a single customer. Literally nobody bought anything. So James decided to go for a walk around the local area. And just a block away from the shiny new Insta Burger King, James discovered a rundown burger stand with a line of customers queuing up around the building. Intrigued, he decided to join the queue himself. And whilst waiting, he noticed that nearly everyone was ordering a whole bag full of hefty quarter pounder burgers served on five inch buns, topped with lettuce, tomatoes, pickle, onion, and mayonnaise. The burgers were much so bigger burger. than what Insta Burger King and competitors like McDonald's sold. James purchased two of the, the giant King sandwiches and headed back to give one to David as well. Ketchup. After finishing, both up until that point. Well, they showed photos well, of it multiple uh, times. Well, it was yeah. just buns, meat, that's it. Yeah, okay. That's fair. Also, like, way bigger, which, I mean, we are in America. <laughs> Through. Yeah. They are in America. This is America. This is America. This is that, America. That burger better be the size of a pancake. I'm be upset. And I'll write a nasty tweet about it. Anyway. David and James agreed it was the best burger they'd ever had. On the drive back to Miami, James suggested to David they needed to make a burger just like that for their own stores. And James even said he had the perfect name for it. The Whopper, a name that would convey the large size of their new burger. James also suggested adding signs to their stores that advertised Insta Burger King as the home of the Whopper. David liked the idea too and agreed to give it a shot. Now, this was actually quite a risky move, as they were going to charge 37 cents for their Whopper burger, whereas other competitors like McDonald's charged just 15 cents for their burgers. So, suddenly focusing so heavily overpriced. on this Whopper burger was a gamble. Fortunately, it was a gamble that paid off. The Whopper's quarter pound patty, mountain of toppings, and signature flame broiled flavor made the sandwich an instant hit and provided David and James with the niche they'd been searching for since 1954. Finally, they had something to distinguish their brand. Of course, James had technically got the idea from copying a small little burger shop in Florida. And it could definitely be argued that all of Insta Burger King's success was really built on stolen ideas. Firstly, Keith and Matthew had copied Everything the fast is. food content. Okay, but like... Everything built on stolen ideas. Get yeah, the, like it's called. Um, I just had the word. I lost it. Uh, it's um. Oh, there's a word for it. I had it. It's gone. What? What was it? Um. But but yeah, like everything in the market is based on some level of like, hey, someone else is doing a thing that works. How can we improve it? Like lately I've been describing like the fundamental pillar of like how capitalism works is solving people solving people's problems more efficiently than the next guy. Now how it works is people creating problems so that they can solve creating their own problems yeah, and yeah, monetarily yeah, prob solving them. Yeah, problem reaction solution. Yeah, yeah. Solving yeah. problems they created. All right, listen. Okay. I also watched uh, v for Vendetta, okay? <laughs> I didn't get it from that. <laughs> no, I know. I've never heard that... Of that before. What, the movie? V for Vendetta? Never even heard of it. You never... You ain't hurt... Okay, you know the anonymous mask, right? The what? The... The anonymous what? The, like, you... The you, mask. You lagged. Oh, the anonymous mask. Well, yeah, they, the anonymous mask, like, the, the, the hacker, like, group that's not really a group, it's an idea or whatever. 
Yeah, but they're the mask that they all wear, right? Like the the thing yeah. that's right. That's from V for Vendetta because the main protagonist wears that mask. That's where that came I, from. I couldn't tell you a thing about V for Vendetta. Is it like a, a heist movie? Uh, that's what my first thought makes it. No, it's wearing a mask like that. Heist movie. It's, <clears throat> it's um. Oh, what would I even describe that movie? Hmm. All right, it's like one part political commentary one part like dystopian fiction thing one part like uprising type deal it's um you, you gotta watch it uh i used to be a huge fan as a kid of it actually um a lot of people you know what's funny it's one of those movies that's like in and of itself it's not even like that incredible it just it presents like a certain idea in such a way that like everyone grabs onto it like super hard if that kind of mm -hmm. makes sense um which was the sense of like big government causing problems and, or even if not causing problems making the problems worse so that they could then um provide a solution that gives them an incredible power boost uh in a uh illegitimately and that's up to the people to put them back in their place and take back their like freedoms effectively it takes place in like a dystopian england where like this where would you believe a pandemic came through killed a ton of people and then the government like to quote unquote like handle the situation took draconian <laughs> like power over the people and v the main character um is like this uh masked freedom fighter uh that's like um putting them you know uh bringing down the government um uh what, what's it called surveillance system um while looking like a, a guy from the like f um 1500s or something because he quotes like a shakespearean type appearance because he quotes like this um uh this event that happened like around the english civil war in like the 1500s the whole um uh remember remember the 5th of november gunpowder trees oh, yeah, yeah, yeah like that whole thing like the thing that popularized that or where that quote was originally even stated from is from v for vendetta like that's all that movie like you should definitely watch it sometime like it's like i said it's not like the most amazing cinematic piece ever but it it, it sticks with you <laughs> it's historical at least a little uh it's like s historical commentary but yeah like the the way it presents the ideas and like the ideas it's presenting like yeah it, it hits it hits you in a certain spot so like it, it s sticks with you kind of like um well, you probably haven't seen any of these movies either like uh um uh, oh, not religiosity. The uh, the Jay and Simon Bob about religion. What was the name of that one? It wasn't religiosity. It was something else. Anyway, um, yeah, good movie. Go watch it. <laughs> it's basically where I'll leave off on that one. Um, all right. Anyway, back to back to they stole people's ideas when really they took an idea and then innovate upon it really like everyone else does all the time like this entire stream you think anything in the stream is unique no it turns out even like the painting and talking about politics i found someone else does that and is, is bigger than me counterpoints <laughs> he's, he's also a centrist <laughs> which i say i'm a de facto centrist because of where you know because i take every individual um like topic like individually i usually end up somewhere in the middle um, mm -hmm. So yeah, even like the centrist, nuancely talking about politics while painting Warhammer, that's not even a new format apparently. So like, yeah, everyone bites off everyone else. That's just how it is. It's too late to come up with unique ideas. Yeah, right. We're not in space yet. So yeah, Zofia, there, are, there is no original ideas. Well, there are no original ideas, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Being bad at grammar is not original either, Zofiana, so you know. <laughs> F. 
or L. One set from McDonald's. Then there. David and James had copied this new signature Whopper product from a different burger chain. But then again, in business, it's often the execution that matters, not the idea. And within months of becoming the home of the Whopper, Insta Burger King of Miami saw an astonishing increase in sales. And for the first time in years, things were truly looking up for David and James. They had the improved burger making equipment, which Oh, also a balding guy in the internet telling people to stop being a loser is also not original, as we know. <laughs> Got him. Got him. <laughs> Which was more reliable, a popular product, a niche in the market, and regular returning customers. However, whilst Insta Burger King of Miami was finally turning a profit, Keith and Matthew's original Burger King of Florida continued to struggle. Years of combating faulty equipment and a lack of direction from them as company founders put them in a difficult financial situation. Eventually, Keith and Matthew followed in their franchisees' footsteps and started flame grilling the burgers instead of using the Insta machines, but it was all a little too late. Keith and Matthew didn't have the same success with their stores and ended up defaulting on their loan. Yeah, I also want to point out for them, like taking the idea of the Whopper from the other the other company, um, the other small little shop. You know why Burger King's around and not the small little shop? Because Bur the people at Burger King were focusing on scaling up. Okay, you need to mm -hmm. like if you want something to stick around and like do well, you gotta look at how to scale up whatever it is you're doing. Um, if it can't scale, it's not gonna last. Um. And uh, yeah, having more resources to do stuff with, right? So like no one would even know what the Whopper is or that format was unless the Burger King guys got it and did it because they had the vision and the resources to do it at scale. Scale mm -hmm. is like so important in business. If you want to, you know, yeah, do anything more than just barely keep a mom and pop shop afloat right which like if that's all you want to do by all means go for it but like if we're talking about like the marketplace of ideas in like a capitalistic market and like the winners and losers like yeah guess what if they didn't quote steal the idea no one would even know about the idea at all mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah they robbed them from millions uh, not really <laughs> they wouldn't they would the other shop would have never made millions because if they were they would have done it because it was, what, 40, no, 50s? It was 70 years ago, or 60 years ago, right? Late, late 50s. Yeah, they didn't mention the fact that that shop had already been in business for 20 years. A little burger stand. And still had only one location? Yeah, right. Exactly. Like, listen, if you're a food place and you still got only one place after 20 years, like, you're, you're trying to be a mom and pop shop and you just got to accept it, right? <laughs> Loans. So whilst Insta Burger King in Miami was flourishing, the original Insta Burger in Florida was going out of business. L. Ratio. Get fucked. Good job, guys. Thanks to the new changes made by David and James, by 1959, their Miami-based Insta Burger King stores saw a massive uptick in sales, and people around the country took notice. Tourists and businessmen visiting South Florida recognized the company's potential and often inquired about opening franchises in other parts of the country. At the time, however, David and James weren't authorized to sell outlets outside of their South Florida territory, which is the region they'd agreed on with Keith and Matthew. However, 1959 was also the year that Keith and Matthew defaulted on their loan. Loans. This meant the person who'd given them the loans, a guy called Ben Stein, took control of Insta Burger King. Now, Ben knew very little about the fast food industry and didn't particularly want to run the business. So James realized this was an opportunity. He asked Ben Jump if he and David could become the owners of both the national and international franchise rights of the mine, company. Mine, 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 and mine, in exchange, mine. Ben would get 15% of all the money they made without having to do any work. So basically- Yo, for real, that's literally what I'm doing in real life right now. <laughs> <laughs> You remember, like, basically every, like, all the people that were doing the stuff that I'm doing now before me, they're all retiring one after another, and I'm just gobbling up all their positions and the work they were doing before for mm -hmm. the pay increase, right? Like, you know what, you guys want, don't, don't want to do it? Great, I'll take over, give it to me. <laughs> I'll do your job. And then, if I get to the point where, like, I want to focus wholly on streaming, I'll just... I'll, uh, I'll keep ownership and just outsource the stuff to like other people that want to do the job. 
Unless someone even bigger wants to come over with a ginormous hunk of money, like I'm just I'm just gonna keep sitting on the revenue. Have you seen Why the game I? Foxhole? The game Foxhole. I feel like I just saw that title somewhere. What about it? I a bunch of my friends have been playing it lately. I've been thinking about it, but every time I like check it out i just get a bunch of reasons why i shouldn't play it oof you know it's a game you should play but you can't play i might you literally cannot play (laughs) what Uh, is it silica i mean this laptop is better than my old pc uh is there a a shot like a slight chance maybe You'd have a, probably have a better time trying to battle bit remaster, which is like Battlefield 3, but Roblox I was thinking looking about it, but battle bit's a little expensive right now. I'm waiting for it to go on sale. Oh, like yeah. Isn't it bucks. like... Wait, how much is that? I thought it was like 20 bucks, no? Down to 15 now. Oh. It's 15 bucks. Uh, anyway. I just bought three $60 games for $5 a pop. 15 bucks for a game at full price ain't worth it to me anymore. I've been spoiled by Steam sales. Yeah, all right, well, fair enough. Um, but yeah, <laughs> Sil- <laughs> saying it how it is, I'm <laughs> spoiled by Steam sales. Silica is like very much in early access, uh, but isn't very consistent updating. But they haven't like super optimized stuff, so even on my rig, because of like connection stuff, um, games can get pretty chunky pretty quickly if the ping isn't good. Um, but uh, but no, it's it's a really good game, it's a hybrid FPS RTS multiplayer um Mm. so like uh per team you have a commander that's playing it like command and conquer like tiberium wars or red alert style and then uh, everyone else is playing as infantry i almost got a command and conquer game yeah just barely won over it though um and then um all the infantry are running around uh as either like sci-fi humans or bugs like giant alien bugs I like um, big alien bugs. I'm always a fan of the big alien bugs that are playable in games. And these are I'm pretty, a third player. These I'm, are actually I'm, I'm pretty good. This. First off, so all of them have perfect wall walk. Like like rocks, buildings, even vehicles or each other. <laughs> Cuz there's a pretty big size difference on some of them. Like in literally like just the tiny ones like wasps can like fly up and like crawl over like some of the giant flyers or like on or like ride on like um the goliath like siege bugs um so that's like pretty cool you don't see people utilizing very often and i don't know why to be honest like because uh oh wait why don't people do this a bunch of wasps on like the fire bugs because the fire bugs they're like maybe five or six times the size of the wasps but they're faster so they could just like fly in like t- anyway um anyway so guard versus nids very close to guards versus nids in fact so close to guards versus nids that the infantry themselves for the space guys kind of suck except against the only the most smallest of bugs you're basically just running over like you spawn you run over to wherever the commander is spawning vehicles of whatever vehicles relevant <laughs> for that stage of the game and then you wait for a vehicle gum come out and you jump into like a tank or a rocket truck or you know whatever or into one of the flyers they just added uh, air units um and yeah i would um i was thinking about this earlier today because i don't know like how my energy is going to hold out for stuff but um uh i was thinking of like at night uh because i've been playing a lot more games lately um maybe beginning to do like small like casual streams i just don't know if i want to do them on the actual channel if i just want to do them in discord of like just streaming games i'm playing um and uh if other people have a game that you know can jump into lobbies or whatever um i'm just not sure if i want them on the channel or not uh because these are not gonna they're gonna have like no production value or anything it's just i'm just playing a game i don't know yet i feel like you should just do whatever you feel like doing so it's going to become it's going to be the more interesting content if you genuinely want to do it yeah, but wanting to do it and having the energy to be entertaining while doing it are two different things, right? Fair enough, yeah. Um, also, like, the things that... It, like, here's the thing. I was just, I just watched this compilation of Mr. Beast doing commentary on, like, YouTube strategy and, like, content creation um, the other day. 
And he was mm-hmm. like, it does, it legitimately does not matter how good your content is if no one actually ever clicks on it because your thumbnails and titles are stupid and, and like do nothing for you. Fair. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, then well, again, that, that's part of why I started TV. making like the better thumbnails. You saw a thumbnail Tyler for today. Oh, uh, well. Well, that, okay, well, those but are. They're special occasions. They're already famous. Yeah, right. Like they're. There are like Great exceptions in rules, famous. right? And on some level, like th- that's how it does work for what he's trying to do, right? Because he's like drama farming, basically, for the most part, right? Um, yeah, yeah, right. If I'm a super tiny streamer, like I am, and I'm trying to go into like a area that I don't do very often, like gaming, um without some type of plan for it no one's going to show up and like it would literally take way less energy out of me for me to just play it like by myself <laughs> you know what i mean yeah, i just turn on because you know you know because of like all the different platforms and how they all work differently and some of them work really dumb like rumble and twitter you know how long it, t- it takes me to like set up to stream now like dude, like today because they're like rumble is having problems like nearly an hour <laughs> Yeah. It's not super worth. Right? For like a casual stream where I don't have a plan, I'm not trying, like there's like nothing going on there. Like this like this, this makes sense. This got plan. I have no idea what my viewer numbers are. I'm not looking at any of my viewer accounts. Like I got the chat. Chat's been kind of like whatever. The thank you, Zofia, for sticking around. Um, but besides that, like, I don't know. But it's also early, like you know, Eastern at like two to five. Like, you know, yeah, it's usually around now it starts picking up. So who knows what's gonna happen going forward. But like, yeah. Um, if there's a bunch of people watching the rumble as there sometimes is, like, tell me. Someone get in the chat. I know you guys don't. Historically, like, almost no one in rumble ever talks, but, like, you know, just put literally anything in the chat if there's, like, a bunch of people watching on rumble right now. <laughs> rumble viewers are fake. They're fake fake news. I've... They don't exist. They were created by your mind. The car accident wasn't your fault. You need to let it go. (laughs) (laughs) Don't say that. I'm going to hit the road in like 30 minutes to go get Burger King. (laughs) (laughs) I just got like a, well, new to me. Your mind reset. and We are going to go through this loop over and over again until you accept that it wasn't your fault. Dude, I watched an awesome Warhammer short day. earlier of of uh, Scarab, one of the little Necron like spider duders, like having an argument with a Necron lord and Necron lord. It starts with it starts with the Scarab being like, "Yay, I escaped the time loop," and then has an argument with the Lord and Lord's like, "I'm gonna put you back in a time loop." And Scarab's like, "No," and the short restarts like, "Yay, I escaped the time loop." <laughs> I was like, yeah. this guy is a genius. <laughs> He's evil and a genius. Yeah. Actual, actual big brain, like content planning and creation like that. That was, that was fire. Um, Cause yeah, it was like a whole thing. The Lord's like, I'm gonna put you back in the time loop. And then I'm going to force you to have this conversation over and over again. So I get bored or trace the infinite interferes again. And scares like, no. Yay, I escaped the time loop. I'm like, oh, you got me. You got me. Ah, <laughs> you did it. You made the time loop. Gosh, it's gosh. real. Made a real IRL time loop. No. Yeah, that was that was pretty bomb. Right. That's what I mean. Like, if you have an actual plan in an advertising like setup, like actual like marketing in your in your stuff, like, then yeah, that's how you get views. See, so yeah, I gotta, I gotta start like taking my thumbnail seriously and have like a plan for content, like a real a, plan for a content. Thumbnail editor. I have tried, dude. I've tried. I've been in talks back and forth with, like multiple artists, and you know what happens? You, you know what? Here's the thing. You know what's crazy? I gotta start offering you a job. You know what? Actually, no. I kind of did once, then the same thing happened to you. Actually, every time I start talking to someone, start taking doing my editing or my thumbnail creation or anything, their life like immediately starts improving, and they like. They get like the job of their dreams or like whatever their current business like starts improving. So they start making money. They get busy and they can't do it every time. That did exactly happen with me. Yeah, it's happened like four times now, dude. 
I, like listen it's 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 like amazing but it's also like so frustrating for me kind of sound like a skill issue i'm just kidding <laughs> now it, uh, like literally i had um oh you know them rat uh rat queen right was talking to her back and forth over and over she's like she's like i just suddenly got this pocket of time that i can like start like doing a bunch of stuff let's talk about stuff we talk about like a thing for like all day you know the next day she's like hey i just got an invite to like go on set and like with this like actual media company and like do like literally what i want to do like literally my dream i'm like dude that's awesome and like the other day she was like yeah i just got back from set it was great super exhausted but it was awesome like yeah but also like no time to do my thumbnails now huh (laughs) she helped me figure out some photoshop stuff and like that was it like yeah this happened like literally like four times directly who's doing that as like their job not just a buddy go on fiverr well that was her job she was like she was just doing commission artists on the on the side but that was like her only like real revenue at the time and i was like i've got money let's do it and like then yeah this this happens like, it, I don't know, it, it's and it, like, here's the thing. I do continuously get those offers from like the people that literally go around, her, like basically like harassing people, like, dude, like I can make you all these types of overlays and stuff. But like, when you look at their, their, um, their actual portfolio, it's just like the super cookie cutter stuff that like literally everyone uses, yeah. but they're all like, it's all like small time. Shoot, like none of the, nothing original, nothing unique. It's the same neon, like, like. Did you hear about the fiber AI stuff. band wave? Uh, I think I heard Fiverr a little lost, bit about that. Yeah, Fiverr lost more than fifteen percent of its sellers to to AI art. Wow, fifteen percent. That is absurd. That's like wild. people have been doing. It, it, it was like that's crazy. That's like art category only. That's not all. That's not overall Fiverr. My bad. That's not fifty percent of okay. all Fiverr sellers. I was about to say that's fifty percent I mean, is Fiverr doing art. okay? Fiverr about to close down. Of all art. <laughs> Sorry, that was fifteen percent of all art. Okay, all right. That, that was uh, of the art categories. Yeah. Okay. Were banned because they were doing they were using AI to to do work and then claiming yeah. it was theirs. Right. But yeah, you get why like I'm having a problem here. <laughs> like I, I don't know what it is. Every time I talk to anyone that like actually could like blend with me, right? Like, you know, actually like uh uh meet me in the middle with like my what I want to do with branding and stuff, um, and not just be super cookie cutter. Um, their life just suddenly starts improving like dramatically and they get super busy, like right after I'm ready to throw down money. Like mm-hmm. like it's like people, I have the money. I just need actual talent that like wants in on this. And yeah, no, it's just it's just me. It's just me. I'm just town over done. here. Finish uh, the town. I sent it to the chat thing. Oh cool. All right. No, okay, Albert. so Burger King is as spicy yet. I don't know. They're about to do the takeover, which just makes sense. I mean, so far, everything I've seen thus far has just been, like, business as usual. Like, this is just how business Ugh. works, right? Mm-hmm. David and James would run everything and have control of the company, and Ben would get 15% of whatever money they brought in. The deal worked for both parties, okay, and the contracts were signed later that year in 1959, meaning David and James now finally had full control of Insta Burger King's operations. In truth, for years they had been the ones leading the company anyway, because even though yeah. Keith and Matthew deserved some credit for originally starting the business, it was David who came up with the name and better burger cooking equipment, and it was James who would come up with their most popular product and other significant branches. Changes. And so the whole time, it was really this duo that had turned the chain's fortunes around. But now that they'd made this deal, David and James made the critical leap from being the franchisee to the franchisor, meaning they would be the ones selling stores to other people all over the world. And officially, they would be the ones making the big decisions about the direction of the company. In fact, one of the first changes was to drop the word Insta from the chain's name completely, since they were no longer using those old temperamental Insta yeah, machines okay. anyway. And thus, the company officially became simply Simply Burger King, home of the Whopper. And now that they were fully in charge of the business, David and James set their sights on becoming the top fast food franchise in the country, which meant somehow keeping pace with the growth of McDonald's. Okay.
1962, Burger King opened seven new stores and posted an after-tax profit of $73,058. By comparison, McDonald's opened 107 new locations and turned a profit of $439,310. Clearly, there was a big gap to make up. But by 1965, Burger King closed that gap to two to one and was on pace to net three quarters of a million dollars the following year. James Ooh. estimated that they were roughly three years behind McDonald's in scale, but as far as growth, they were matching the pace that the industry leader had set. And by some metrics, such as new stores, so by the way, again, like um, based on the inflation calculator I did earlier in the stream, uh, basically just take all these numbers and literally 10 exit for today's numbers. So if they say a million, 10 million at least. Um, they, you know, yeah, it's actually like, I think it might technically be closer to 9x, but yeah, for napkin math, just add a zero at the end store openings, they were even gaining ground. James got excited, thinking they might actually be able to catch McDonald's in a few years and become number one. Then, everything changed. Oh. In April 1965, McDonald's went public with an initial stock price of $22.5 a share. By the end of the day, the stock value hit $30. By the end of the month, it reached $49 a share and continued to climb fairly steadily for the next three decades. Today, a $1,000 investment in McDonald's' IPO would be worth over $6 million, and that doesn't include the dividends it would have paid over five plus decades. But basically, the huge success of McDonald's on the stock market meant that the sprint for supremacy between Burger King and McDonald's was over before it even really started. At least, that's how everyone outside of Burger King saw it. James, on the other hand, believed they just needed the right partnership to help them compete with McDonald's. Someone with a lot of resources. And sure enough, in 1967, the Pillsbury Company, one of the world's largest food producers, approached Burger King about a merger. James was immediately very eager to strike a deal because he believed Pillsbury would either take the company public or finance the exponential growth required to keep pace with McDonald's. His business partner, David, on the other hand, and felt Burger King would be better off staying the course and remaining independent rather than relinquishing any control to another company. Then again, David also knew that James, who was 41 at the time, was feeling pressure from his wife Nancy to dedicate more time to his family. And so by making a deal with a big company like Pillsbury, it should mean James and David had more support to run the business and thus free up a bit more of their time. After all, they'd been working non-stop on this company for years. So for that reason, David could see the merit of this merger. Having said that, the deal that Pillsbury put forward required James to stay on as president and CEO for at least five years. His salary would increase from $32,500 per year to $67,500 per year, the equivalent of around $600,000 today. Literally doubled his salary in like one sign, like one, one paper signing. Yo, what a, what a week was that, huh? You still there, Sai? Alright, well, for everyone else, dude just doubled his salary. That's wild. Oh, Sai isn't here. Oh, he moved himself. Alright. and he would be granted full autonomy to continue running Burger King as he saw fit. More importantly though, Pillsbury verbally agreed to grant Burger King access to its considerable resources. This meant that James could assign others to handle some of the travel and day-to-day -day operations, leaving him a little more time with Nancy and their children. So the deal was agreed, and Pillsbury absorbed Burger King and its 247 restaurants for $18 million. The deal also resulted in James, David, and their other investor Harvey owning 10% of the century-old Pillsbury company. This was a huge huge corporation, and meant on a personal level, all three of them became very wealthy. Nevertheless, the deal was not quite the perfect partnership David and James had hoped for, as it soon became apparent that Pillsbury had no intention of letting the company operate completely autonomously like they'd initially suggested. They became quite
actively involved in decisions Burger King was making. As a result, on August 21st, 1969, David actually resigned from Burger King and the Pillsbury Company. He remained in the restaurant business for the next half century, developing new concepts and investing in other franchises, including several competitors to Burger King. James, on the other hand, stayed with Pillsbury for longer and kept pushing them to either take Burger King public or restructure their franchise model to more closely resemble McDonald's. Unfortunately, Pillsbury's board was unwilling to take the same risks that Ray Kroc had with McDonald's. In fact, Pillsbury felt Burger King's growth had been too rapid, allowing their franchisees to become overly independent. As a result, they chose to pump the brakes and slow growth until the franchisee situation was resolved. Mm. For context, in 1968, the year after the merger with Pillsbury, McDonald's opened 109 restaurants, whilst Burger King opened 108. But by 1972, McDonald's was opening a new store every day, whilst Burger King's number dropped to 91. Disappointed with the slower growth approach Pillsbury was taking with the company, James stepped away after his contractual five-year commitment. Although he would remain a consultant and brand ambassador for Burger King until his death in 1996. At the time of James's retirement in 1972, the number of Burger King restaurants in operation around the globe had nearly tripled from what he and David sold to Pillsbury just five years earlier. So there's no doubt that the company had continued to be successful. But Pillsbury's plans for steady growth didn't quite match the huge ambition and expansion plans James and David had had. And to be fair to Pillsbury, there was a reason for their caution. By expanding quickly, it meant Burger King hadn't been able to carefully monitor all of their franchise locations. And as a result, the experience you got in one Burger King store was very different to that in another Burger King store. And Pillsbury wanted to make everything more consistent. So they began a plan called Operation Phoenix. And it all began when they managed to poach a high-ranking executive from McDonald's, a guy called Donald Smith, who would go on to initiate several key changes to Burger King Wait. using lessons he learned from his time at McDonald's. He just managed to also be named Donald. Okay, that's pretty funny. For example, Burger King began buying more of the land that Burger King stores were built on, so they could lease this to franchisees, thus giving Burger King more control and creating an yeah, important McDonald's new revenue source. Thing. Donald Smith also yeah. broadened the menu, created new store designs, and helped standardize the look and feel of all Burger King restaurants. The changes were undeniably successful, and helped set a solid foundation for future growth. However, since the Pillsbury merger in 1967, ownership of the Burger King Corporation has passed between numerous different investment firms. Some some of which did push for faster expansion. For example, in 2002, TPG Capital purchased Burger King for $1.5 billion and took the company public in 2006. The stock sale generated $425 million in revenue, the record for an IPO of a US-based chain restaurant. Okay. In 2009, its best year ever, These Burger King posted revenue like of $2.54 billion dollars yet, from 12,000. With a computer. What? What's that? What? You need a PC. Do you want to set up VR with the computer? First, you need a PC with $2.5 billion, and then a VR headset worth $425 million. Not even, dude. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Which did oh, push. I, I want to see those numbers, though. Like. For faster expansion. For example, in 2002, TPG Capital purchased Burger King for $1.5 billion and took the company public in 2006. The okay. stock sale generated $425 million in revenue, the record for an IPO of a US based chain restaurant. In 2009, its best year ever, Burger King posted revenue of $2.54 billion from 12,078 outlets worldwide. Over the next decade, that number climbed over 19,000. Then in 2010, 3G Capital purchased a 31% stake in Burger King for 3.26 billion, eventually King. merging the company with- Actually, that's a valid question. What is the most- Is there like a Burger King in Uganda or something? Is the Vatican Republic, uh, does Vatican City have a Burger King? I, mean, I don't know if that's obscure, oh, but it's small. North Korea. North Korea has a Burger King inside their uh, capital. They have like a couple random fast food places there. Map of Burger King locations. Let's see. <clears throat> uh, I just see a bunch of ones with US, like a bunch of the maps. Oh, okay. All right. Actually, I had the Burger King website. Uh, I'm going to select region. Um, all right. Let's, yeah, you got to check by. I mean, I would assume all of these. 
places have one because they don't have all the countries, I don't think. Hold on. I'm going to ask chat GBT what the least populated country that has a uh, Burger King is. With the lowest population that has a burger. Well, it's not Vatican City because that's not in the list of markets. Andorra. Andorra? Andorra. A-N-D-O-R-R-A. Andorra, officially principal uh, principality of Andorra, is a sovereign landlocked country uh the Liberian peninsula and the iberian peninsula in the eastern pyrenees bordered by france to the north and spain to the south oh yeah that little dot yeah uh, okay i know what you're talking about yeah the iberian peninsula is the peninsula that spain and portugal dominate yeah they have a burger king okay <laughs> good to know <laughs> So well, now I know if I'm ever if I'm ever backpacking I, 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 between I'm, Spain and France, yeah, I can get a Andorra. Burger King. <laughs> if I'm in Andorra and I need something to eat that's local, they got a Burger King. Yeah, I can I can I can I can manage to bridge the uh, <laughs> translation barrier there. I'm sure I'm sure we can we can figure it out. <laughs> the pro the population is approximately eighty thousand. Jeez, <laughs> that's smaller than my town. That's funny. All right. Anyways, with Canadian coffee house giant. What's that? I was just curious. Anyways. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Tim Hortons to form Restaurant Brands International, Tim which Martin. is the current parent organization of Burger Jim King Martin. at the moment. Estimates of Burger King's present value vary widely between about seven and ten billion dollars. However, whilst Burger King's owners and parent company has changed many times over the years, there is no denying that the foundation of this fast food empire was laid by James and David's relentless determination. Still to this day, decisions they made back in the 50s, like the introduction of the Whopper, have played a pivotal role in helping the company expand expand into so many new locations. Whilst the original co-founders deserve some credit too, it was really James and David that transformed the company from a failing restaurant into a success, by gambling literally all of their money on the business and going all in on it. But there is one company that made a much bigger gamble. Have you heard the insane story of FedEx and how the founder quite literally bet the company's remaining money in a casino to try and save the business from bankruptcy? What? If you haven't yet seen this, you're gonna wanna check it out right now by clicking the thumbnail on screen. I hope you enjoyed this it's story working. of Burger King. And it's I'll clickbait is working. <laughs> okay, I mean, uh, listen. But also, um, all right, now I know why this, this channel has, uh, what one point whatever million subscribers this channel is pretty fire however i didn't see any spice though i did not see much spice either um i mean the only spice i saw was him saying that they had a rocky time starting out yeah which like it's fine i mean if anything like this story was filled with a bunch of pretty baller business moves honestly mm -hmm. um so I guess end result, Burger King's just a okay burger place. Yeah, it's just it's just a thing. Like there's no yeah, there's no there's no sauce. There is no sauce. Yeah, there's Both no on their there's, burgers <laughs> and on their lives. Right. Like you can like you can make the arguments that like in general, the types of food at a fast food place are not the healthiest, but like no one ever like argue i'm that. not denying it <laughs> yeah i'm not denying it um, i mean i understand that am yeah. i still gonna eat there yes but yeah but it's like there's no <laughs> big like conspiracy Some of the best to, food like... places are the ones that don't give a fuck about how healthy their shit is yeah just focus like, on making delicious the, food um... yeah forget the name of it but there's a particular brand of frozen meals that are like the only frozen meals that are specifically designed to not be healthy it's like we're not trying to be healthy we're trying to make a good fucking tasting meal uh and then they end up being the best most popular one i forget the name of it though it's not munchies it's something like that though gotcha devour 
the Devour brand frozen meals. Oh yeah, I've never seen it. Don't have them up here, I guess. Um, okay, so big fast food conspiracy. Uh, it doesn't look like it's in Burke, and at least nothing that's like publicly available that like uh, people like because we just went through three videos from three different creators that basically gave like the same general plot line with a different um focus on different details but so we had one that went over the general business progression all the way through to like modern day basically then we had one that went over their marketing oh shit and then we went you over one just now about the original like brand development effectively how how about we do a little bit of our own research I asked ChatGBT, what is the worst thing Burger King has done as a company? And it came up with one of the notable controversies surrounding Burger King was the horse meat scandal in 2013. Was that Burger King? I thought that was McDonald's. It was revealed that some of Burger King's suppliers in Europe had been selling beef products that contained horse meat. This led to a significant public outcry and raised concerns about food safety, yada, yada, yada. Okay, let me let me action and terminated contract with the suppliers involved. All right, let me let me. So it seems like it really wasn't Burger King's fault. The the suppliers started doing fucked up shit. Okay, so yeah, and it's still and it's still like Burger King, nothing burger on the conspiracy front of just like some type of evil like corporate empire thing. Burger King ain't it. Right? Like, we have not what found our evil empire yet. <laughs> Dude, when you're on ChatGPT, they got an update. So now whenever you add a message, you can just hit a visualize button. And it uses that as a prop to make a picture. That last sentence I just read to you, I, I just did that. I'm going to send it on Discord, the image it made. It make, it looks like the Burger King, the Burger Killed Teenagers is, is <laughs> like what it What? It, <laughs> what? <laughs> right? Look at this. Look at this. It's like headliners. I just DM'd it to you. Some on my phone with it. Hoglast to Hogesilasas, Meenagers in Seved. That's. I don't think I like any of that. This is the image. Okay. Oh boy. <laughs> um, Listen. Okay, so they had some weird, like, supplier thing, but doesn't it didn't seem like it was them. Okay. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna give like if we're looking for our evil empire corporate overlords, Burger King ain't it. <laughs> That's my conclusion on that. They're just a company. <laughs> it just yeah. I mean, unless their current owner is doing something shady, well, like the guys that also own Tim Hortons, I don't know. That doesn't feel like that's going anywhere. <laughs> um, yeah, all right. So it's like six o'clock. I have the option of either I actually do go get Burger King, which I'm still kind of on that train, or I go get some roast. Uh, oh, my dad made a roast. Um, I am kind of tired. No, I, I think I... I think I do kind of want to <coughs> go get the thing. All right, hold on. Let's... um. Which water do I have in here? I was like, let's do some, like, drugs now. I asked Chad GBT who would win in a fist fight between the Burger King and Ronald McDonald. And it told me, as an AI assistant, I can't predict the outcome of fictional fights between Ronald McDonald and the Burger King. There you have it, <laughs> folks. <laughs> the answer we've yep. all been waiting for. AI, pretty <laughs> intelligent on that one. That was pretty good. Alrighty. I'm going to go hop off and get ready for my work shit. I will see ya. Okay, I'm gonna go. Yeah, I'm gonna go get Burger I'm gonna go, King. I'm gonna go I'm get. Gonna go eat Burger King now. Yeah, I'm gonna go get Burger King, and then we're gonna do like a night shift where we're gonna dive into, I guess, like KFC and Monster Energy Drink, I suppose, because <laughs> those are the two other brands on the K on the CFC mall right now. Then probably. All right, bye. Okay, well, for everyone else, anyway, um, that'll probably close out tonight, and then tomorrow, we'll uh. We'll probably dive into McDonald's because that might be an entire stream in and of itself. Um, but I also kind of want to hit other ones like Five Guys. Well, I don't know if there's really anything about Five Guys because I actually kind of already know a decent bit about that. Um, 
Is Chick-fil-A just a northeastern thing or is that bigger? I don't know. Um it, probably McDonald's can be the big one, but seeing as they're on a CFC, we'll we'll do tonight like KFC and uh, Monster Energy. But uh yeah, for now, I'm gonna go like get Burger King on way back to eat it and give my review and a pricing up uh pricing report and stuff. So yeah, but so I'll I'll be back in I don't know, like twenty minutes. Okay. Took a little longer than I thought, because for anyone still there, would you believe in the like four minutes between which by the way I got every single green light on the way. In fact, my fortune was so good it seems like the scale needed to rebalance because would you believe I hit a deer on the way, just got this car. It functions, everything functions, but like the, the front's all beat up now and now I gotta call the insurance in the morning. So, amazing. Uh, so, what was gonna be, let's see, 18 something minus the dollar I decided to donate, because screw it at that point. Um, so like 17 something after tax. I got a medium soda, the large halvesies which is like onion rings and um, fries. Seems kind of heavy on the onion rings, fair enough. Um, and a double Whopper. Um, but this might turn out to be like a couple hundred dollar burger king. <laughs> we'll see, I have no idea, I don't know. Uh, I should, like I just got the car, just got the insurance, I don't know what the uh, exact amount's gonna be, I don't even have an idea, anyway. Let's see it. This is going to be interesting. So I'm gluing sensitive, so I can have a little bit of gluing. So what I'm going to do is I am, I can handle the onion rings. I am not going to have this entire thing here. Oh, I forgot to tell him no tomatoes. Oh, it's fine. I've never liked tomatoes. All right, let's take a look. So yeah, it's kind of just what I expected. Um. Does Whopper not inherently come with cheese? Yo, that's wild. I had to tell him a cheese Whopper? What is this? Okay, all right, all right. Uh, that's frustrating. Granted, I was a little, I was a little distracted because Lily was. Yo, this is the fat rat. Yeah, that's, that's bad enough cheese, just in case. Um, I was a little distracted because it was like right before I pulled in the Burger King that I hit the deer. So, all right, okay. Um, do I want to go get a fork to eat this? Probably. I didn't want to um, ask for a less wrap or whatever, because I wanted to review like the whole thing. Breads, I mean, it's big. Um, this is probably just fine. Yeah, I mean, we'll see what the taste is like. Um, yeah, I'll be back in just a second. I'm gonna go for Something about like the lack of cheese is like frustrating me more than I think it's the lack of cheese. It's like insult to injury. <laughs> but I didn't ask for cheese because I was distracted. I don't know. Whatever. We'll just we're just gonna continue. I don't even know if I'm talking to anyone right now. Probably not. But <laughs> anyway. Uh woo, okay. How do I wanna do this here? 
Actually, this is so, um... Dry in the bottom? Actually, I don't think I need to... I'll just use the meat as the, as the bread. Here we go. Mmm! It's like fine. Like, okay. Kind of overcooked, if I'm gonna be honest. Not like terribly so, but a little bit. I definitely need a cheese. Um, I'm wondering if I had had it with the bread, if it wouldn't have been too dry wholesale, as it's kind of dry right now. Bread, I think tomatoes st supposed to partially ma make up for that, but I don't like tomatoes, so maybe that's just a meat problem. Oh, the meat's just kind of lackluster, if I'm gonna be honest. We use some pepper, actually. Some pepper would really make this pop. Tell you what, pickles and mayo are good. I'm not even a big fan of mayo.
All right, so the double whopper. Minus cheese, because oops, I guess. I don't know if I'm supposed to come with cheese, to be fair. I really have no idea if that was a meat problem. But I'm brought anyway. Um, kind of meh. Honestly. We have not even big on mayo, and mayo is the best part of that burger. The meat was just kind of dry. And like very little flavor. Very little flavor. Yeah, all the flavor came out of pickles and mayo. <clears throat> that was just very boring meat. So it's just a cove, so whatever. It's a Coke. <laughs> it's a... Uh, it's Coca-Cola. I got their sweet and sour sauce. Is that worth anything, even? <clears throat> it's up. Very dark sweet and sour sauce. Oh yeah, I forgot how high I have the camera. Um, it's a very dark sweet and sour sauce. Okay. It's a little bit more on the salt side, but it ain't bad. Onion rings are pretty good, actually. They're fairly salty, which I prefer. Yeah, I can get behind the onion rings. Fries are actually really good. This is this is a good fry. This is nice. Alright, sides are good. I kind of had a feeling that'd be the case. I don't know why. I had a feeling that, ironically, the sides would be the better part of the meal. Yeah, honestly, fries are among the better I've had in a while. I think when, I think in the future when I'm out and about and hidden deers, I'll, uh, if I want just like a snack I might get Burger King fries like these are these are pretty lit actually Okay, honestly, I really like salty fries and, and salty onion rings. You see that? That's like, it's like gold standard right now for me. 
Yeah. Yeah, that's good. I mean, it's a, probably like four times my daily allotment of sodium. Yeah. So I don't get. Well, before it was ever. Now it might be more often. That's nuts. How much were the side? How much was this half Z box? This is a large half. -Z. How much is this? Let me see. So the eight dollar burger, not worth it. Five dollar halvesies, maybe. I mean, it's pretty good. I just don't know if it's five bucks by itself good. Were the sauces anything? No, the sauces were free. Okay. Yeah, sorry, I'm just having Angie kind of sucked out of me by the adrenaline and uh, incredible annoyance. Is this what I get for doing gags? I don't even know if this is a gag, but anyway.
So, halvesies, pretty good. Would I pay $5 for that again? Yeah, possibly. Yeah, I might do that. That that could be a thing in the future. If I'm just on the road looking and needing a snack. There's a Burger King nearby. It's, uh, it's a likely choice for me, honestly, after that. Um... Double Whopper? Nah. Uh, three dollar Coke is a uh, little dust, but especially uh, being a medium. I mean, actually, I mean, for a medium, it's, it feels like most places large. Am I sure I didn't get the deal right? Uh, I don't know. Maybe they gave me a large anyway. Hmm. Okay, um, well, I'm sure sauce sour is fairly good. It's a little on the, um, double side, but it's not bad. I don't have any complaints with it. Okay. Um, man, yeah, I just got a lot of, I might have sucked out of me. Um, hmm. So... I don't want to save these for later, actually. Let's see inside. Uh, right. So, hmm. Painting and deep diving fast food. I believe our next look at was going to be uh, KFC. I want to say. Is there anything weird and suspicious in anti-consumer going on in KFC? I was going to be honest. Besides, like... Some like quality, basic quality control stuff. Burger King is truly a nothing burger on the um, malevolent front, it seems. And they made some killer commercials. Their marketing team is A. So uh, we have. Dismissed one company, so part of me is like that feels like a win. Actually, it's like a win for humanity. 